Hello. A couple of days ago, I was able to have the pleasure of a discussion with both Jennifer Roach and Robert Ballin, who are converts to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and very well informed and trained theologians. Both of them shared their perspectives on joining the church and the manner and the way in which they were taught by both the missionaries and the members and how that education and training was both good um, meaning that the training was sufficient to answer and resolve questions, but also where there were deficiencies that they felt could have been improved. And then they provided some very practical and helpful advice about how to do that. I think the discussion overall is very productive, and I really appreciated the opportunity to just be part of it and to listen to their comments, especially from the perspective of two people who are very well educated in uh, material that many of us overlook or don't have the time to really deep dive into. It's a great opportunity. Anytime we can um, extrapolate the knowledge from other people and learn from their perspectives and their their training and understanding, especially as members of the church to view the perspectives of converts. Um, hopefully this is a good discussion and you enjoy it and it's very productive and helpful. You mentioned on your post and I, I really liked it uh, from a week or so ago, <clears throat> And because uh, I've known about you, I've, I've watched several of the interviews you've done on Saints mm -hmm. Inscripted and with Robert, of course. And uh, I was really interested in the comment that you made that the missionaries, when they taught you the restoration, the apostasy, mm -hmm. the questions that you had, and kind of just going through what was your impression, what mm -hmm. was missing, and that kind of a stuff, if you could just yeah. kind of, and then Robert can do the same with his own experience. Okay. Um, so part of the background of understanding this is, um, I was in my late forties when I started taking lessons and had a significant theological education by then. Having conversations with 19 year old boys, um, who only have what they learned in the MTC maybe what they learned in their in their seminary classes, which often are not great or deep. Um, and so there wasn't even common language to talk about stuff. And so on my end, on the investigator end, I had to do a lot of figuring out what it meant that they were even saying because they had no understanding that we were using the same words differently. Mm -hmm. So I had to do that work on my end and I'm perfectly capable of doing that. However, I want to be careful how I say this and not say it in some insulting kind of way. There's a wide range of theological education that the average Christian person has. Mm -hmm. The vast majority are probably in the bottom 20% they've read a couple books, right, that might teach them a tiny bit of theology, and they've sat in church for a long time. Um, but in the, in the Protestant world, at least, there are far, 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 far more people who take a deep interest in theology who are not professional ministers. So the last church I was in, before I left and joined the LDS church, it's a congregation of a like about 300 people, maybe we'd swell up to 400 people at certain times. Um, and there were at least a dozen people in that congregation who had a master in divinity, right? They're, they work at Microsoft, they work for Amazon, they get a degree like that because they're interested in it, not because it's their profession. Um, and there is no um, equivalent in the LDS world. There is no like easy access to, to higher theological education. So not to say all LDS people are uneducated theologically. That's clearly not true. However, you are much more likely to run into a Protestant who knows some stuff mm -hmm. if you're a missionary than that you don't. Mm -hmm. I had... Um, I had a lot of... So I took lessons for nine months every single week. I don't think we missed a week for nine months. So I had a lot of lessons and a lot of missionaries. I was taught at the same time by two elders and two sisters, and we did our lessons together, right? So, so I met 
many, 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 many missionaries. Um, the fact that we were having trouble communicating with each other, they would most often make a move towards spiritual understanding, which mm -hmm. is an easy, an easy move to make and a good move, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, they would encourage me, if I didn't understand something, they would encourage me towards prayer, towards, towards meditating on it, towards thinking about it, right? And, and that's good. Um, but I think for your, your average investigator who has at least some theological education, it's not super helpful in terms of understanding what's being said. Well, um, just just can I mm -hmm. interrupt and just say one thing? Yeah. So one of the things when I was taking classes in psychology in my undergraduate, the mm -hmm. I had a professor that said it was really a profound thing that stuck with me. He says, once you define something, mm -hmm. you can't even define it until you've identified a term. And once the word has been mm -hmm. identified, now you can develop criteria and kind of a whole philosophy and thought process mm -hmm. underneath that term. And I think that that's our terms are, mm -hmm. are, are lacking. Yeah, so um, Stephen Webb um, was a Catholic, mm -hmm. um, a Catholic priest, an intellectual, has written a bunch on, on kind of Mormon Catholic relations. Um, one of the things that he says is for a Protestant, it's like entering into a house of mirrors where everything is the same, except for that it's not. It's mm -hmm. it, everything is sort of skewed and you look taller than you are and you look shorter than you are. And that was very much my experience because um, same word, same words, different meanings. So if you have an investigator who is more educated in theological things, being able to define terms and and talk about how you're identifying those terms differently. Like, don't get stuck on that. That's not the point of a lesson, right? Um, but when someone is stuck in understanding, going back to the identifying terms certainly helps. My best example of this, is, it, Travis, is the one that you brought up of, of teaching the restoration. Every single missionary is trained thoroughly in like, here's how we teach what the restoration is. My experience was they're trained in a mostly, it seems to me, narrative kind of approach mm -hmm. where they tell the story. Here is how it happened. Um, and that is probably a helpful way for, for many, many, many people. If you're dealing with an investigator who has deeper questions than that, they're not asking the how did this happen question. They're probably not even asking like, do you have historic proof that this, you might find somebody who's doing that. They're probably asking the, why was this necessary question? And very often when I would ask that question, the missionaries would come back with two or three kind of standard responses of like, well, look how bad it got with Martin Luther, you know, before Martin Luther's time. And look at these, you know, couple examples of apostasy. Um, and it it is not enough information to, actually answer the question. Um, so helping an investigator really like drill down and identify what is it that they want to know will help the missionary figure out how to answer that question. Because if they don't understand what that person's actually even asking, how are they going to, they're just going to retell the story of the restoration and that isn't helpful for a person past a certain point. Well, and the thing that's really interesting about that is even the narrative approach that you're describing isn't mm -hmm. in the Preach My Gospel. Mm -hmm. We did a, we started off doing a, um, every once in a while, I'll do like a Sunday discussion where I put a link on the, on the Facebook mm -hmm. page and a bunch of missionaries will log in. And we just decided to read through the Preach My Gospel manual mm -hmm. and just kind of look through it. Mm -hmm. And the whole first chunk of the first lesson mm -hmm. is interview the person you're teaching ask them about their understanding of the nature of God, you know, mm -hmm. don't, don't dictate or tell, but ask, mm -hmm. develop some kind of a, of a foundation. Cause I mean, somebody, everybody's going to believe things a little differently, obviously, mm -hmm. but figure out what this individual person understands about, like, if they believe in the Trinity, what's mm -hmm. their understanding. And, you know, as you and Robert discussed in your video, it's probably modalism, <laughs> 
but but understand what they're talking about. And I think that the reason that's there, at least from what I gather from reading the, the manual myself, mm -hmm. is it looks like that's trying to set the foundation for, and here's why the apostasy happened. And here's why mm -hmm. a restoration was necessary. That lack of clarity you're kind mm -hmm. of describing, that ambiguity that you feel, that uncertainty about the what you're expressing to us, here's how that was overcome through a restoration. Mm -hmm. But if, but they're just like, like you're saying, they're just starting with a narrative type. Yeah. Two, two positive examples of how that was done well for me. Unfortunately, neither one of them are missionaries. They were members. Um, one of them was a woman in the ward that I was attending said, I really, really want to understand like where you're coming from. Um, at the time when I was still taking lessons, I was also still employed um, at my church. And so I was there in the morning. Our ward was in the one o'clock slot in the afternoon. So it worked out for me. Um, and so she said, like, I want to come to church with you next Sunday morning. And I want to, I want to come visit your church with you. And then maybe we could talk about like, what even happened? Like, why do you guys do all the things that you do? And that was such a, um, a helpful thing for her to be able to I don't know. So she tried to look at it through my eyes and I don't think she totally, I was angle hand. I don't think she totally understands what most of that was about, mm -hmm. but it did give her a couple of points of like, why do you, why do you say it this way? Oh, interesting. We say it this way and here's why. And it was a really like just natural kind of conversation point. I don't think you have to go to church with somebody else to be able to do that. Having the kind of conversation you're talking about could could allow for that. The second example is, um, I don't, this was a member too. I don't know that most members are up for this, but literally I read through the entire Pearl of Great Price and the Book of Mormon, probably 10-ish chapters a day. And at the end of my reading, I just wrote out questions. Um, I emailed them to a friend who is a member some of them he was able to answer and some of them he wasn't. I kept the ones he wasn't in a notebook and brought them to the gospel principles class on Sunday and kind of put them to the group. Um, and then they, uh, lots of them were able to offer insight into things maybe because they were older or they'd just been around the church longer. I don't know. Um, but getting an investigator to, to clearly articulate, like here's my list of questions that I need to get addressed before I can make a movement, it, it was just incredibly clarifying because at some point th the list of questions is done, right? Well, and, and think, then- So I, I love that because one of the things that, I mean, again, it's like changing the dynamic of our church mm -hmm. and it's, it's really hard to kind of do that, but it, I, I think that there needs to be some change in the way that we think. Um, so, for example, we, we hear the brethren in, in general conference say things like, you know, the church isn't there for you. You need to participate in the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you gain something by giving something. So go to church with the intent of helping and assisting and building and uplifting mm -hmm. other people. And if you'll do that, church will become fulfilling and rewarding. And that's what I found with myself after, after my mission, you know, I came home mm -hmm. and I'm like, Oh, you know, I had two years of never missing a day and I'm going to take a break kind of an idea, mm -hmm. which was overcome through this idea that you need to contribute, which is a, mm -hmm. a bishop kind of sat me down and taught me that. So, but what's happening is, is that I think too many times somebody prepares a lesson and I'm going to finish my lesson. Mm. And then when somebody changes the subject slightly or raises mm -hmm. an important issue, rather than saying, okay, we're going to take sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so's issue, or even an, an investigator, you know, somebody mm -hmm. who's investigating the church, and let's focus on that thing. And then the whole class can abandon the lesson. Mm -hmm. And let's just talk about that and work it through yeah. for this person. It's it, just a, it, a much better way of doing it. It's a real challenge, I think, for people to do for understandable reasons, because they don't feel like experts either, mm. right? And so an investigator, I mean, like me, like I come with my notebook full of questions after about the second week in gospel principles, the, the teacher kind of wisely said, like, like, look, you're the only person here. I was the only investigator in the class most of the time. They're like, mm. 
let's we'll take you to your... gospel doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> let's deal with your actual questions. And so, and so that's what we did. But even, even in that, when I was the investigator, I could sense the discomfort around the room of people who were afraid because they're like, I'm not the prophet, or I can't give you a definitive answer. And I didn't, it, if I wanted a, a definitive answer, I could look it up on the website, right? Right. Like I could, I could go listen to some, some Russell M. Nelson talk. Um, what I really wanted was how is a normal person who's like me working this out in their, in their lives. And I wish that regular members were less afraid of that. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, so what would you, what would you give as advice to regular members? So one of the things that I really harp on with mm -hmm. the missionaries and I, and I understand um, like Robert, Robert lives in a very small, is it a group or is it even a branch? It's a very small branch. Like yeah. um, mm -hmm. how it's like 50 to 20 people on a regular Sunday and it covers 140,000 people of the County. So, yeah. wow. so, it's, it, it, yeah. so the idea that a missionary is going to be able to take a member to every lesson mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, yeah. I would be taking Robert every time I went if it was one of the duties there. Mm -hmm. Robert, you're gonna go with us again. <laughs> but but they're they're I think that the members are thinking the missionaries are the experts at teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like we forget they're 18 when they mm -hmm. as soon as they board a plane or they like Yeah. I here's my I was... here's my 18 year old theology. Right. I was professor. lucky enough to have I had members attending every single one of my lessons. I also had my my friend who I was emailing every single day Book of Mormon questions to joined on through Zoom. And that was brilliant because that mm -hmm. was somebody I had an on, like a previous and ongoing um, situation with where I felt like um, this isn't a person who's just trying to get me to sign up for their pyramid scheme, mm -hmm. right? Like this is somebody I, I already know. And so like any time an investigator knows someone who is a member, even if that member lives like three hours away, if technology allows it, if their mission president allows it, like loop that person in because mm. that's a, a really good kind of touch point. It becomes much less transactional that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that about 50% of the discussions I've been doing over the last year with the missionaries via Zoom, about 50% mm -hmm. of them have actually been decent, polite, mm -hmm. cordial discussions. I mean, occasionally there's the, what we call what they call the dumpster fires of, sure. you know, here I am and here's my pastor who also doesn't know anything, but, right. but, uh, but no, in the process of kind of, of, of involving a member, they, they can mm -hmm. form a stable connection also. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's just, I think that members are, they're afraid. Mm -hmm. and, and I keep telling them like, look, you don't have to be an expert at theology. You just have to be the stable person who can ask a relevant question. Like say, mm -hmm. Jennifer, you keep talking about the Trinity. Mm -hmm. What exactly is it that you're talking about? Yeah. Like, how is that different from what we're teaching you? Explain yeah. it to us yeah. rather than let me tell you. And are you aware that the, yeah, they don't need to know that stuff. Yeah. I, um, my heart goes out to the missionaries because they are in they're in that position for a reason. It, 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 the members have done it to them a little bit, have made them the experts. Um, I would not be in this church if it weren't for a regular member making a kind of bold statement to me that I could have very easily been offended at. And that's what sparked my interest. I'm not suggesting that members or missionaries like become obnoxious. But I do wish that members and missionaries sometimes weren't so afraid of being a little bit bold. What, what's an example of that? Well, for me, how it happened was my friend and I were talking about Moses. I gave my opinion and he said, I have a different opinion than you, but it's because I have scriptures that you don't have. And I was like, what are you talking about? No, you don't have scriptures I don't have. Like that's a fantastic hook, mm -hmm. right? It, it also was risky because I could have been like, screw you. I don't, I don't have to listen to you. That's fine for me. You know what do we do? And, I, and I'm not saying we want to exclude people from the church, but if somebody's going to be easily offended. Yeah. Because we I'm, really actually do have scriptures about. Yeah. They're going to be offended. 
yeah. their third Sunday or their 20th Sunday. I mean, somebody yeah. is going to say something obnoxious yeah. to them. And it's better to, let's just, I mean, be, be a little bit bold, I guess. Yeah. The, in my experience, um, I mean, this is generalizations. The elders are a little bit better at this aspect than the sisters are. I was taught by both for nine months. So I saw a lot of it. Um, the, the sisters do better on patiently drawing things out without putting pressure on the person that says, if you don't advance as fast as we want you to, we're dropping you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I actually really loved my experience because I had both, um, but most people don't get that. Most people get one or the other. The elders could learn from the sisters to be a little bit more kind and patient and understanding. And the sisters could learn from the elders to be a little bit more bold. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, and I think that that's a, that's a, I mean, that's perfect because oftentimes I have missionaries that say they're not progressing, drop them. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, what have you done? What have you really done? Mm -hmm. As far as what work have you put into the, the conversion process? Well, it's the spirit that converts. Yeah, yeah, the spirit can't convert when somebody doesn't understand our view of salvation. Yeah. And you're talking about. And, and it's often the cop out. It's like, yeah, the spirit does convert, but, you know, he, he, he uses means, you know, God uses means in everything. And you have to yeah. try to want that. And it's like, yes, he converts, but like he converts through teaching. He converts through. Mm -hmm x y and z like he even converted uh very indirectly through like um the journalist mentioning like the book of moses you know to mm -hmm. uh, you yeah you know? i love that story by the way because like we of all books to uh lead uh it's the book of moses you know i, I yeah love it, you know? it's a, it's a great um example because like to, i mean just to be honest at that point so he was a journalist he was writing stories about me ongoing we were still in the middle of all of that he still needed my help if I had gotten really offended and been like, forget you, um, all of a sudden he's in trouble at his job, right? Like yeah. the, the, the boldness of that is what it honestly is what I needed. I needed somebody who could kind of shock me into paying attention to it because well, all of my life, I just been like, oh, those Mormons are weird. Well, and I think that with the spirit converting, that is a, a the mm -hmm. one of the big problems with the misconception of that. The spirit is involved in the teaching process, but sometimes the spirit converting is somebody receiving a prompting to say mm -hmm. something. Yeah. To 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 like I, I'm just going to say this popped into my head. I keep telling the missionaries. I said, look, the spirit is like a person who lives in your brain and has access to a filing cabinet. Mm. And they go through and they look for answers and they look for things to say that, you know, whatsoever I have said unto you, mm -hmm. that whole idea. And if there's nothing in your drawers, <laughs> the spirit's going to shrug his shoulders and say, I this got is nothing. Where, yeah, th that's a great example because this is where the um, maybe less educated, um, lower economic status person who's kind of in need where that investigator probably has a way easier time than a protestant who has a bunch of theological education because their file cabinet is overflowing with information mm -hmm. and sometimes it's hard to start to organize it in a way where the two systems can talk to each other especially because we use different we have different meanings for the same words and so it requires more patient if, if anything i would say elders like please please tune into the spirit about issues of patience and sisters please stop being so worried that you're going to offend people and that your only move is the sweet smile because the bold the bold move sometimes is what people need or the emotional story which mm -hmm. you know those are great in yep. their context but that can't be the basis of it. i mean uh it was it was uh, Kimball or was it Benson that said that unless our testimonies go down to the tap roots and the understanding of the Book of Mormon, then, mm -hmm. then we, we just don't have a sufficient foundation. Of course, I just butchered that quote, but um, it's one I keep on my phone. But, I, <laughs> but yeah, if, if we don't understand, if we don't understand what the Book of Mormon is, why it's mm -hmm. important. I mean, I mean, even even as a basic understanding that the, what it's kind of nails in the chalkboard to be the Book of Mormon is just like the Bible. No, the Book no, of Mormon. 
<laughs> the Book of Mormon is a very different mm -hmm. kind of text. And the, the, the first cue of that is Bible means library. Yeah. Book of Mormon. Like, right. It's a book. One of the, in my opinion, so I'm a mental health therapist. One of the things I think kind of drives the disconnect here is um, men in their young 20s are interested in proving competency. Mm. That is their developmental task. They want to prove to the world and themselves that they are a grown man, right? So they often take their need to prove that, which is an appropriate developmental task, but bring that into conversation with investigators and it turns into, I need to prove to you I'm right. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a missing of like, what's your need as a human being, as a, as a 20 year old young man versus like, what did this investigator actually need? The, the developmental need of young of women in their young 20s is how am I in relationship to people? Um, and they are desperate to prove that they are worthy of relationship and worthy of being like chosen and wanted. And they bring that into their discussions with investigators. And so it becomes sort of this over emotive, I want to connect with you and that's gonna help you make spiritual progress. And it might make it easier for some people but it also is bringing their own needs into the, the conversation and confusing those with what the investigator actually needs. Right. And, and an emotional reciprocal relationship that causes somebody to, so you did something for me, I do something to you. And, and mm -hmm. so now you, you've been so nice. So I'm going to join your church. Yeah. I mean, that's not sufficient to. Correct. It might be for some people, but I also have questions about like, how long do those people stick around? Mm -hmm. The missionaries are going to be gone very soon. Mm -hmm. And so that 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 connection, well, and it works, it'll last longer if that connection, again, is made with a member mm -hmm. that's local, yeah. then and that member is con cognizant of the idea that that connection has to be developed. So I've got, I've got several friends that um, have joined the church in the last few years. And, mm -hmm. and they have, I, I've noticed that if they're going to stay active, you know, some of them have stayed active, some of them have mm -hmm. not. But if they've stayed active, it's the universal thing is, is my, one of my really, really good friends that I love dearly. In fact, we were mm -hmm. gym buddies and, and he stayed active because he reads the Book of Mormon. And if mm -hmm. he doesn't read it, he listens to it mm -hmm. and he participates in church callings and he's kind of invested himself in the church. Mm -hmm. And then being my friend, he always asking me questions like I read this. And what does that mean? And, mm -hmm. and so he's actually investing himself intellectually and spiritually both in the church. And I think that like you said, I think sisters focus on one, elders mm -hmm. focus more on the other. And they, they, I wish they were learning from each other a little bit more. I think the way missions are set up makes that hard and that's okay. Um, well, and I'll tell you, so one of the mm -hmm. things from having served a mission, mm -hmm. there's, there's a, there's an antipathy between the yeah, there the is. two where the, the, the elders think the sisters don't do it right. And the sisters mm -hmm. don't think the elders do it right. Yeah. And I think that they don't realize that they're two halves of a coin mm -hmm. because they're not married. <laughs> yeah. If, <laughs> if, if, they, if they were in different kinds of relationships from each other, they would see each other's strengths and learn from each other. And they're two or three, four or five years away from being able to do that. Um, it it, well, it is what Well, and recognize when maybe it's time to have a sister pair teacher investigator mm -hmm. in yeah. some kind of a, hey, will you guys drop by? Mm -hmm. this person and and give it a shot where you've yeah. hit hit a wall or something so yeah so specifically and and robert please i i want to hear your two cents certainly as well on the the idea that when when they're teaching how so more practically speaking so they come in and they're teaching you know, the apostasy and the restoration, you know, first discussion. I, I don't know when you taught, they were still doing, they were doing preach my gospel, right? The, the five discussions. Me. Yes. Robert. I don't know. You, you were had the six discussions, correct? Uh, I only got two lessons because I was never actually taught by missionaries. They only taught me once <laughs> I made the decision to be baptized. My story is much different. So, so, so yeah. So you, you weren't, 
a product of that. So, and that's, that's the thing that's interesting and unique about the two Some of you. would say for the best. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know as a, as somebody who was born into the church, I kind of geared towards being more of an atheist growing up. I I've always internally struggled with the idea that there is an unseen realm and, a, and a, I, I'm just a more, I, I have, I've struggled against my own desire for objectivity and I've decided to accept religion and and put you know Alma's challenge of faith to the test, and I, I, I've developed my own my own faith tradition in that way, and I've I've adopted Latter Day Saint theology. But it was it was difficult. It was really difficult to kind of set aside you know proof and objectivity for accepting a different epistemological perspective. But in in doing that, I had to convert myself. And so my parents weren't like my mom isn't real doctrinally literate. She's not real theologically trained. Um, my dad was pretty good with the scriptures. He was pretty smart, but I lost him when I was young. So kind of finding finding that I actually found it by going to other churches, the Catholic church, you know, Protestant, local Protestant churches and things with friends where I talked to ministers and pastors who would give me like, here's actually what our doctrine is. And then I had to study Latter-day Saint theology on my own to really develop an understanding of it. And so I think that your stories are more of a story of putting in a lot of the work yourself. So how, you know, keep going. How has that been advantageous or disadvantageous? I, for me, I don't think there is any other way that it could have happened. Um, uh, you know, so, so I grew up in the seventies and eighties when I, I think anti-Mormon stuff was, was higher than that it is now in, if you, if you correct for the ability to access the internet back then it was, um, it was bad. The church where I grew up, we watched the God maker movie in church every single year. Right. So I, went, I, I went with a friend to the Baptist church to watch the God makers. <laughs> I grew up in Baptist church. We watched it every single year. And he was trying to save my poor soul. Oh, it didn't work. <laughs> well, you win some, you lose some. You lose some, right? Um, there, there are people, there are plenty of people in the world who are going to believe whatever they are told. And, and that's how they are. And they're, that's not going to change for them. But if you have an investigator who is more theologically curious, they have to do their their own research, right? If if missionaries can sort of point them to like here are the official church answers, if you're reading other things, please compare them to here like what's on our website so at least you're getting the answer that like would be the official answer. One of the things I did when I was when I read through the Book of Mormon the first time was I decided to myself to say, I just want my own clean read of this. I'm not going to go on anybody's website. I'm not going to read blogs. I'm not going to do anything. My second read through, I absolutely will. But my first one gets to be my questions. And the questions I came up with aren't ones that I Googled, yeah. right? So trying to get to the heart of what an investigator's question actually is, not the question that they got from somebody else's website, because that's not their question. Mm -hmm. And if you answer a question that isn't their question, it doesn't move them forward at all. So trying to help them really discern, like, do you actually like care about X or, or is it really this? Like tr trying it to help them clarify that I think is a better practice. And I'm going to quote you what you just said and post mm -hmm. it on the because nice. <laughs> that was excellent the question that they actually have not the one that they googled that's yeah that's fantastic that, the, that's the, better than bob miller <laughs> the questions that they google are important right i'm not saying that those probably don't well, have they, to get answered they can for be, some people they can be made important sometimes they're correct yeah they can they, become important to the person because it does create some because that's the thing is there's this there's this um discontinuity Mm -hmm. that you've got to resolve. And I think that's why you've got to define your terms. You've got to have criteria. You've got to have 
some kind of a stance for mm -hmm. the term and understand mm -hmm. what it means. Like what is in, in, in Latter-day Saint theology being saved mm -hmm. doesn't just mean one thing. Right. And, and so we often think, and that's where I think you said we're talking past each other, certainly mm -hmm. because saved is this in Latter-day Saint theology, but it's actually this in yeah. Latter-day Saint theology and saved is this in other, other theological, um, philosophies and so yeah and if they're coming at you with that question and that's their actual question great but if they just read that on a website and was like now I have a clever way to stump the missionaries that's not even a worthwhile question to spend time on unless you can help them drill down and figure out what do you actually want to know well one I, of the I don't know if the I'll missionaries are great at that and one of the things I'll often do when I'm doing the discussions with the missionaries on Zoom calls is that mm -hmm. they'll say, they'll ask me a question. And of course, a lot of times, because I've done a lot of digging into what the typical objections to the church are, mm -hmm. and I'm, more, I'm just more familiar with them, I think, than your average missionary is, is they'll say something and I kind of know where it's going mm -hmm. or where they're, where they're trying to lead me. And sometimes that's what they're trying to do. They're playing, trying mm -hmm. to play a, a game of gotcha and yeah. they'll, they'll raise some objection and I just say, Okay, and that matters because mm -hmm. exactly why. And what it does, it makes them think like, why? Why does that matter? Yeah, one of the one of the things my friend who I was emailing with said to me was um, just kind of jokingly. He says, "I'd love to see you in a theological debate with two nineteen-year-old boys. Like, there's no contest there." And and for me, it, I mean, it's such a silly little statement. But it flipped me out of the desire to make it be a debate, it, it out of like, I need to prove to you that you're wrong, and flipped me into how can I, as the investigator, do the work to understand what it is that you're actually saying? I, I kind of needed somebody to call that out for me. Right. And and that's the difference in the sincerity between, you know, the different mm -hmm. types of discussions I've had recently is the, uh, I mean, I've, I've been going out and doing this kind of stuff for since I got home off my own mission, but mm -hmm. In, in kind of those different, the different paradigms is there's always the ones that are trying to play gotcha. And, yeah. and I always tell, I'm like, you're 53 years old. You're playing gotcha with a 19 year old. Yeah, well, why, did they, <laughs> why did they bring you? And I'm like, well, they brought me cause I'm 40 and yeah. I, I know more than the 19 year olds and I've yep. experienced more life. And they're like, well, that's just, why don't the 19 year olds know? Because the 19 year olds are taught to go get the 40 year old to come yeah. help them. That's yeah. the way the church's missionary program is set up. Yep. So I, I think that those are just just kind of ways in which. So what what's adv advice to embolden members? To, to mm. well, one of the things, um, one of the issues I think is like a worldwide problem. Once a lot of members, even like in say uh, more developed countries like America and Ireland and the UK, would be. Uh, really like the apathy towards like learning more um i'm not sure you know that's one of the issues now i'm not saying like you go out you learn say hebrew U ugaritic or you can have a uh, debate about like say the economic versus the uh, hyperstatic filioque cause and stuff like that that's not although i'm think myself and jen could actually do that uh, well, as say, Robert, that's a great new episode for us <laughs> yes but uh, but at the same time like um my stress, um, I'm not sure, like, but maybe you've experienced this as well. Like, if members do their like 15, 20, 30 minutes a day, you know, read the scriptures in context and maybe read up like some good external sources here and there, uh, I think things would be much better, like, both on the local level, but also like when it comes to the missionaries. Um, you know, I've come across like some very smart missionaries, but they tend to be the uh, exception to the rule. Now, I'm not saying like the normal missionary is an idiot, but at the same time, I've come across a number who are very ignorant of their faith they have an ego they and the same when it comes to many members like uh they're either very anti-intellectual or they think if you have a question like uh you should be dropped so i don't know maybe like trying to imbibe like a greater desire to like just do say your 20 or 30 minutes a day i think that would be um a very good st st uh, step um for everyone you know mm -hmm. those listening here and stuff like that or you know, if you find yourself like discussing things with say uh, largely say Protestants, you know, um Protestants tend to be a more academic, um, at least creedal ones, you know, read what they believe, like a very good resource I, of, I always use, and you're probably familiar with this, Jen, mm -hmm. uh, Shaft's Creeds of Christendom. 
Yeah. You know, um, get this and just reference it. Like, this has the Westminster Confession. This has, like, say, the Articles of the Apostate Anglican Faith. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. The Earth Deterring the Nine Rod. You know, but joking aside, like, this is a very good source book. Like, um, imagine, like, you're, uh, the, uh, the tides are turned. Like, um, say you're in their shoes. What would you expect them to learn? Uh, do you, like, if they were to study the church, and, like, be familiar with the Doctrine and Commons, be familiar with, with the Armour, mm-hmm. be familiar with, like, say, the very basics. You know, so you should do the same. You know, uh, so, yes, the goal is to convert them, but, like, you will have to, like, answer the questions. You'll have to also know the different presuppositions. Like, Jen alluded to this. Like, we often use the same terminology. Now, ours is a biblical terminology, like, when it comes to justification and salvation, mm-hmm. contrary to what they will say, but at the same time, there is, like, semantic differences. And that comes down, ultimately, say, to authority and presuppositions and stuff like that. So... I'm not saying, like, say, an 18, 19 year old elder from Idaho or a sister from, like, say, Maryland or whatever, you know, should go out and be, like, experts in the theology of John Calvin. But if you're going to, like, say, you know in advance where you're going. So if it's going to be a largely Catholic audience, read a basic book or two in Catholicism. If you're going to, like, say, England, uh, read a basic history about, say, the Church of England or Anglicanism or read the 39 articles of faith, you know, uh, not that difficult to do, even in the archaic language, you know, so. Be familiar with your audience, and also be familiar with what you believe, and make sure it's not superficial either way. Yeah. And, I, and I think, like, if we were to incorporate that on a like, global level, um, it would be much better, you know. Um, yeah, the thing I wish that members and missionaries alike would stop saying is, well, I'm not a scriptorian. Um, like, don't name yourself as what you are not, because now you have just taken away your own motivation to become better at learning the scriptures. You should be on an ever increasing quest for more scripture knowledge. Stop saying, I have friends who are my age in their fifties who still are saying that. That might be fine to say if you're 14, but mm-hmm. if you're a full grown adult, you have had plenty of time to learn how to study and the church has given you plenty of tools. Stop saying that, become one. And mm-hmm. and just to add to that, like all throughout the scriptures, not just like say the upper echelons of the church, but like the normies, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which we belong to, you know, they're commanded, not just expected, but commanded, like, be informed about the fate, like, you have to give a reason for, it's like, uh, the, uh, you know, the Apologia text in Peter, you know, he's speaking to the normies, you know, not necessarily, mm-hmm. like, say, the upper echelons or the BYU mm-hmm. lot of the time, you know, to be, give a, a reasoned answer to those who question you, or, like, in section 71, you know, like, um, of the Doctrine of Common, it's like a modern version of that as well, you know, so, Yes, you know, uh, first of all, the whole, I'm not a scriptorian, that's usually a cop-out for, like, I don't like the implications of this text, so um, I'm going to end there. It's like, a, it's a, a uh, taught end or whatever the uh, English term is. But, uh, no, it's like, the church has given us, like, very good resources, like, uh, the three mm-hmm. volumes seem to be four volumes of saints, mm-hmm. that's a very good... If you want to be a, say church history, that's what I'm working at professionally at the moment, you know, more or less... Uh, that's such a very broad topic, or like the scriptures, that's very broad as well if you want to like learn as much as possible, but the church has provided like very good, sound, um, general, accessible uh, sources to like um, lead to other studies and stuff like that when it comes to scriptures, when it comes to church history from 1830 onwards. Um, you know, and a lot of the controversial stuff is like mentioned there, and you can, with the further reading as well, so it's not exactly like, say, the church hiding stuff. It's like uh, my friend Blake Oster once basically joked if the church ever wanted to hide something, they'd canonize it and tell people to read the scriptures, and that way no one will ever read it. <laughs> uh, in fact, so I was true. just going to say, that's the amazing thing, is the number of, of uh, times that um, somebody will ask me in church, well, have you have you ever read that? I'm like, yes, I've read that. And they're like, you've read that? I'm like, have, hasn't everybody read that? I mean, what... I mean, I cannot it's on tell the gospel you, library I app. You I cannot tell it? you how many times I've had the conversation with someone where I've said something from church history that is in saints. Saints is written at what? Seventh grade level? Something yeah, like seven that. Seventh or eighth grade. Seventh or eighth, yeah, usually. Incredibly, incredibly accessible history. And I have said something in there and they're like, you know so much about the church. I've been in the church my whole life. I didn't know that. Well, goodness sakes, it's a 200 page book. You could read it in five hours. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing, like, um, maybe uh, to go back to this, I can understand, like, say, if someone's a very recent convert. Like, I know, uh, relatively speaking, you're very recent, but, like, you have a theology background and stuff right. like that. Like me, you're a nerd. But, right. like, say, thank you. The relative, yeah. And I mean, uh, you know, I mean that affectionately. But, uh, love, like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, nerds for the win. But, um, 
I can understand, like, say, why a very young person, you know, like a 14-year-old, even if they're a lifelong mm-hmm. member, may not be up to snuff when it comes to certain things. I would not expect them to. They have other right. things to do, like schooling and all that jazz. But if you're or, like, a very recent adult... convert, but like, yeah, like, if you've been a member of a church for, like, say, 10 years, 20 years, 30 yeah. years, and you've been active all throughout, um, it... For instance, like, say, take Joseph Smith being a polygamist, like, one of the more controversial topics. Now, if someone's issue is, like, Joseph was a polygamist, and the church never told me this, it's, like, section 132, bro. <laughs> now, if it was, like, something yeah. very specific, like, say, you know, uh, John C. Bennett and these alleged claim of a, uh, an affair with Sarah Pratt or Fanny Alger, like, okay, I get that, but yeah. there's certain things that can't, can only be explained away by a willful, and it seems to be a very deliberate, active ignorance. Well, yeah. it's, and it's, again, it's like the like, whole the church didn't spoon feed that to me. They didn't yeah. tell me that during this primary. is members. Yeah, this is members who say, "I'm so bored in sacrament meeting. I'm so bored in Sunday school." Okay, fine. Figure out how to engage your mind on the mm-hmm. topics that are being talked about. Figure out how to study. Learn how to source an original document. How do you read it? Go to the Joseph Smith papers. And I see, like, blah, especially blah, blah, with the advent blah. of the, especially with the advent of the internet, like there's loads of routines that are like accessible, not just the scholars, but like even, again, your random, Anyone. your random, yeah, it's like the church history library, like they have so many stuff, uh, on digitized for yeah. free, and even if there's like something not digitized, you can just like drop in an email, give an explanation, and oftentimes, unless you're like super um sensitive, like say, um, an excommunication record or some other thing as well, like mm-hmm. some other legal document or something like that, um. They shouldn't, they're very, very good for that, you know, even if it's just yeah. like for you. Um, like you know, the Joseph Smith papers, the Wilfred Woodruff papers, you know. Um, when, sure President Nelson, like... when President Nelson says, don't be a lazy learner, this is what I think he's talking about. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think, think, that's like, a vis- people, I think a lot of the uh, visceral negative reaction to that was like um, something internally. So, like, uh, you know, like uh, you work in like mental health, so like whenever mm-hmm. people like um, are doing something wrong and they get called up on this. Thing, yeah. Cause how dare you? You know, I'm not guilty. Yep. I, I'm sure there's a term for that. I think a lot of the negative reaction was basically, um, yep. um, them kind of at least subconsciously, if not consciously, realizing like they're being called up. But it is again, an actual like, problem in our church. Yeah, yeah it well, is. And, and, it's it's, and it seems to be global because it doesn't seem to be just localized here. Yeah. You know, it seems to be in America, it seems to be in England. I know in Poland it's a mess as well um, mm-hmm. because it's my favorite country to visit, so I know all about that, you know, and a bunch of other places as well. And that's same, like, it's in the developing country. I, I, maybe, like, if, like, uh, this was, like, say, a very new area in a church where, like, it's third world country would be a compliment. I can understand, like, say, why there would be issues. But, like, sure. when it comes to, say, developed countries like USA, Canada, even Mexico, uh, mm-hmm. Ireland, uh, and all that is, like, what the heck? And that seems to be, like, a very anti-intellectual strand of thought that seems to be permeating the church. It's like, yeah. um, and it seems to be, like, the characters are, like, say, the Mormon epistemologies, warm fuzzies, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, that seems to be, like, um, mm-hmm. you know, like, cultural Mormonism, but, like, it doesn't seem to be localized in Utah. It seems to be, like, a very global strand of thought as well that's acceptable. It, it's that paired with the fact that, um, in the Protestant church, I, I, it's this way in the Catholic church, but that's not my experience as much. In the Protestant church, there is a huge developed entire industry around biblical studies and all of its daughter disciplines. And there are hundreds of thousands of people who are working on those subjects. In our world, it's about that big and mm-hmm. it's extremely poorly well, developed. It's one of the reasons that I, as I, as I was pursuing my own education, I mean, I had mm-hmm. kind of indicated that I was going to either pursue law or medicine, but mm-hmm. as, as I, as I studied more um, in my youth, I was like, you know, I'd love to have a degree in a field like Robert, where I, I mm-hmm. went in and I pursued and I thought, but you can't make money or do mm-hmm. anything yeah. in the church with that, with that kind of a degree. And, and <laughs> Not to say that there's not positions for that, but it didn't even dawn on me. And I wonder how how many people think, I mean, you've got like Terrell Givens. Terrell mm-hmm. Givens has an entire, an immense theological knowledge, and he's mm-hmm. been studying that, and he's pursued advanced degrees. I mm-hmm. mean, history, you've got Richard Bushman, who's done a significant amount of, of work in Mormon studies. Granted, of course, he's also a, a, a professor of history, but there's mm-hmm. a, there's a robust um, number of works that are produced by a very finite number of yeah. people. I mean, Blake Osler is an attorney. 
Yeah. But, um, jo Jonathan so, to be fair, Blake only sleeps four hours a day. So that's. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan Stapley is a chemist. Right. Like he, right. His, his book, The Power of Godliness. I read that when I was investigating. Excellent. Beautiful. Clicked so many things into place for me. But dude spends his entire day doing science uh -huh. and and felt so compelled about these theological issues to somehow have the discipline to learn all of them and then learn how to write about them. Like, we need more of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like uh, Brian Hills is in this, uh, I think yep, it's my but he's, like, and he's an anesthesiologist. He's but it does kind of show, like, you can do your nine to five and you still have the time, mm -hmm. even if you have kids and other yep. Things, you can still do your 20 to 30 minutes and if you were to do your 20 to 30 minutes maybe like once in a while it doesn't have to be as regular as like us but you know once in a while maybe reading something external like say you know i you know i keep hearing about say like us uh, catholicism or anglicanism mm -hmm. in the news it's like i don't really know too much about why anglicans believe say um you know insert anglican belief here mm -hmm. you know or catholic belief here it's like okay maybe i'll actually read what they say about it and it's like once you kind of do your 20 to 30 minutes regularly each and every day yeah even if you're like even if you're like a young teenager, you know, it, it will actually pay dividends, you know, both for yourself, but also like you can impart it to others as well. Like say teaching as a missionary or a gospel doctrine saying, or, you yep. know, if you set up like say some of the website or like even on a day to day discussion, you know, um, Brian, you know, Brian Hale still has children at home. Yeah. Right. Jonathan Stapley has young children at mm -hmm. home. Like, I get it that doing this level of work, like, that's a serious hobby. Um, and we need more people who are interested and willing and not afraid and can kind of throw their oomph into, into something that's entirely out of their field and figure it out. But also, the very fact that there's other people who have done it means you don't have to uh, feel like you have to uh, reinvent the wheel every so often. Correct. Mm. Correct. You know, like, say, when it comes to, say, liturgy, like, Stapley's book uh, is excellent. Mm -hmm. So, like... Is there other areas, you know, that one could build up on it? Definitely, but at yes. least when it comes to Stapley, you have a very good yeah. secondary resource, and you can actually check the sources. Like, a lot of them would be accessible these days, even online. Yep. Or, like, say, you know, say you find out you're going to a largely Protestant country, like the Bible Belt, like Arkansas mm -hmm. or someplace like that, and you want to bone up on, like, say, how to respond to, say, common objections for, like, say, Bible alone. It's like... Some in here is written a lot about that, so you don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. But like, Correct. if you think like there's like maybe some ideas or some texts that may not have been dealt with adequately, mm -hmm. at least you don't have to like do it ex nihilo. Like, there's a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of the objections. There's already like say some kind of grounding already, or like a yep. lot of the areas. There's at least something there, even if it's minuscule at times. Or like you might be the one you know who actually pushes the Mich envelope a bit. Yeah, missionaries, in my experience, were completely unaware of that entire industry, right? Like not one of them knew who Richard Bushman was. Yeah, that's, and that's, yeah. Well, they're, they're amazing. They're 19-year-old kids, I get it. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I, tell, I tell them to read something like um, Wrestling with the Angel by Terrell mm -hmm. Givens or yeah. Crucible of Doubt. I have mm -hmm. a, a really good friend who I recently turned on to that book and he's like, that is just, I didn't know something like that existed. Yeah. And he's like, wow, that's just, that's going to be so great. Cause he's, he's in the bishopric. He's like, that's going to be so great mm -hmm. to kind of address some of the concerns I have with the youth to be able to use Terrell's views on, yeah. it's just like. So how do you think like a good way, I know this is your turn, but like, this is just me trying to out like. No, no, you're. How do, you, how, how do you think like a good way for like to make say Bushman's biography or his work, mm -hmm. like say, say, you know, I work for an organization that actually does a lot of the stuff as well. Like how to make that uh, available or like. It's, it seems like it's, for some people, like they're not trying to be willfully ignorant. They just don't know it's out there and they're not in, necessarily informed or they don't stumble across it, you know? Yeah, this, this um, is the, the cultural piece that drives me insane is there are there's a certain kind of member where if it is not 100% published by the church, it's automatically suspicious. Mm -hmm. So when I was reading Bushman while I was investigating the church, I had said that to several members and I you know the look I got it was oh right like you shouldn't be reading that um he was a mission and president it, and is a patriarch <laughs> uh, this is not right. some yeah but he lives in Massachusetts or oh yeah Massachusetts, well and he went to yeah. Harvard and stuff yeah, so, so he's, he's got dollars intellectual dang the, liberal <laughs> the the cultural piece where I mean it kind of is the spoon feeding bit of I want to be told 
from the official source exactly what to think. Instead of, I can take a source and evaluate it for its usefulness. I can evaluate it, it for all different kinds of things. Members don't seem to know how to do that. I wish that would change because then what Robert is talking about becomes super easy. Right. You know, because like there's the gospel doc, uh, the gospel topics essays, and you know, mm -hmm. well, one would take exception maybe with a few things here and there. Like they're a very good resource, and like you know, for they're for everyone. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's a case like uh, I don't know if the church maybe like were to like plug a bit more uh, frequently, like very good mm. sources, even not necessarily secondary sources, but like uh, sources for primary documents, like the church history library or. A certain organization holiday utah you know that's some your works for you know or stuff like that you know it might be useful because um you know reading secondary literature is very important i'm not trying to like say trying to downplay it but like um and i think you guys would definitely agree with this like um you know the whole reformation slogan i can't believe i'm using something from the reformation ad fontes mm -hmm. um you know if you're firm if you're familiar with the primary sources like the scriptures and maybe the journals or at least know how to access them and you know read them you know e even when they're referenced like um you know that that will save like a lot of like initial uh, a lot of legwork when it comes to say mm -hmm. if you want to delve deep into something or something yeah. that comes up you know or stuff like that you know and well i even like... find that well i even find that commentaries like a commentary on the book of mormon yeah you go tell somebody to read one of those you, you show them something and they're just like well you know um uh, I mean, you've got some members who are like, yeah, this is a great commentary and they'll pass it around. But really what they'd rather do is go do like the New Testament seminary manual. Yeah. Or, the, so so that is so interesting because those manuals are um, completely de-identified, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's no footnotes. There's no, this thought came from so-and-so. Um, I saw something from Ben a couple months ago that a, a quote, Ben Speckman, a quote from him was going to be in... I can't remember whatever manual, but of course, like he's not given credit for it. He's not, he's not footnoted in any way. And not that he needs the credit, but to give somebody a link that says like th this person's ideas on this topic are interesting enough to listen to that we're telling you whose ideas they are. And, I and wish we did team. that. Yeah. It, and we don't do any of that. Yeah. Because like, imagine like you're coming across like, um, something say, um, the history of interpretation, say one Corinthians fifteen twenty nine, the baptism of the dead mm -hmm. text, you know, yeah. or like, you know, what does the Greek actually use the pronoun day? But you know, there's a whole debate about that and stuff like that. It's like, you know, I I've never I this is my heresy. I rarely whenever I'm teaching, I rarely uh, read the manual. I just see what chapters are to be discussed. Yeah. But be that as may, um, you know, say they reference something, and say like, um, you know, scho uh, non LDS scholars say you no know, Paul is leading to a Christian practice, a current, not a pagan practice. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I'm sure like loads of people would like to say, okay, so where can I read the article in JBL or Fadus Testamentum about this? Is like, there's nothing. That, it's bald assertions. It, you know, which, which it, is a bad thing. Like, People think that the manual writer is the person who has come up with all of these ideas. Oh, no, they think those... the apostles wrote it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's the problem. Or at least it has the authority of scripture. They just, you know, they, okay that, they just think the apostles did it. It and just like, fell out of heaven. The apostles assigned a committee under some other, yeah. Yeah. you know, the church and, education and for Listen to this and... presentation. Ben Speckman, he has like a number of posts on this and presentation. So uh, be sure to check out that um, yeah, non-canonical status of these manuals. You know, so. Right. It drives me insane. Right. And that's why a lot of times when I'll talk to somebody who's antagonistic, they'll pull some manual from 1973 that was published and they'll say, well, this is the, uh, that's not the, the, the problem though is like even the modern manuals for the most part are reliant on like say very late uh, scholarship. Like um, mm -hmm. a lot of the New Testament stuff uh, are dependent on, on Farrar and a couple of others from like the turn of the 20th century who McConkie was fond of, but like they're okay for like maybe like historical uh, intellectual debate, uh, discourse and stuff like that, the intellectual history of something, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I was like, well, you know, 19th century, you know, because it's important to understand like what the scholars in the 19th century were saying, like for a Latter-day Saint context, you know, of course, you know, the century 18th, but to rely on them as like, or like Alfred, uh, Idashim or whatever his name is, um, you know, he, he wrote a lot about like, uh, Jesus and the temple and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's okay. But like, um, it's okay to use old scholarship, but like when old scholarship is like has been disproven, especially pre nineteen forty seven scholarship on the Old Testament yeah. or the New Testament, um, 
beat things up. You know, it's, yeah. it's okay to reference Bert Ehrman, even if Bert Ehrman's often wrong, you know, or some other source as well. Well, you, you just know. have to, you just kind of have to. So what I do is I just compare Bart Ehrman with somebody like Daniel Wallace. And if they agree, <laughs> that's, I know that's, that's, a, that's a good indication. That, it's uh, actually, it's that's a, except for the longer yeah. ending the mark, they're both yeah, wrong yeah. about that. Yeah. So yeah, they, but I mean, cause Daniel Wallace has an extreme, he, he's know, pretty conservative yeah. and mm-hmm. then, you know, Bart Ehrman, I don't know if he's extreme. You know, he's not trying to disprove anything. It depends on his audience. Yeah. It does. It's like, yeah. um, when it comes to Ehrman, there's a difference between Oxford University Press Bart Ehrman mm-hmm. and Harper Collins Bart Ehrman. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know which true. one of those put out the uh, the worst book. I, I couldn't hardly even get through it of his was the. Uh, the one on Problem of Evil? Yeah. Gosh, it was just. That, no, that, that was Harper Collins Bart Ehrman. It was just awful. And it was just sound like. When Ehrman is running as a New Testament scholar in these fields, mm-hmm. he's brilliant. Like his translation yeah. of the Apostolic Fathers mm-hmm. is awesome i know it's it's orthodox corruption of scripture is like that's the book that made me want to learn greek it was mm-hmm. that good i read it mm-hmm. once in the university i was thinking which, which book Hebrew. did you say again orthodox corruption of scripture yeah it came out originally that's in 1993 it. um you know i read it in one sitting in university um i was thinking of just focusing solely on hebrew i didn't think i oh, wow. want to use greek i read that book and it's like to heck with it i'm taking these postgraduate courses uh, even as an undergrad in greek uh you know and that kind of maybe uh you know um so and believe me that's that's been pretty useful in like uh, discussing soteriology with Protestants, you know but um I used to, it, it, it was that it was that informative so like it, again like it kind of depends but like when it comes to say a, sco- uh, a scholar writing for uh for even the general audience but like a scholarly general audience if you will that's good and that's ehrman well, so, uh, well, sorry no, didn't mean to cut you off chat no you're fine Oh, I was just going to say, I used the Daniel Wallace grammar when I was in this Same here. And that's yeah, his, like, he actually I mean, yeah. a lot. Oh, he's yeah. tons. Yeah, his like papers Acts are really great. Yeah. It's like, uh, take Acts 2 8 where it says, like, uh, be baptized for the remission of sins. There's a lot mm-hmm. of nonsense about ice for. Yeah. Like, well, you know, you know it, it's, a, it's a resultant, you know, like, you know, you take a tablet for a migraine, you know, so, like, the migraine precedes taking it. You know, the mm-hmm. the whole nonsense. He, although, he, confessionally, he would have to reject baptism being salvific in any sense. You know, he's a Reformed Baptist. For them, it's a commandment, it's a symbol, but it doesn't affect yeah. Protestant salvation. That's because he's from He Texas. basically rubbishes the idea, like, um, of a causal ice, you know, and he basically calls up his fellow co religionists um, you know, uh, for coming up with it. You know, I, I have to, you know, so, yeah, uh, Greek. Well, every, every uh, once for those in a while. listening, it's Greek grammar beyond the basics uh, and exegetical mm-hmm. syntax of the New Testament. It's uh, really it's funny because occasionally, just to be just to be a jerk, I'll I'll quote Daniel Wallace to somebody without citing who he is. Well, that's just some <laughs> Mormon guy. To play. Or just say no. Bart oh, Ehrman. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, not Ehrman. It's Wallace. <laughs> yeah, that's actually Daniel Wallace. And I'm like, you should you should oh. Google who he is and then tell me that he's an apostate. So right. Yeah, just just that kind of that kind of level i don't think you have to have that but i mean a lot of this stuff's really super accessible daniel wallace does lectures on youtube you can listen to mm-hmm. him in your car oh, and those other Bill lectures Mounts. yeah mounts mounts he runs a blog yeah Ooh. okay uh i'll fix that later <laughs> did it break yeah i'll fix that later can you guys still hear me yeah yeah, yeah we can okay yeah fine. good yeah, I'll just hold it up like this. But no, Mounts, he actually runs a very accessible blog where he does yep. this Greek, but it's you don't even have to know Greek to actually understand what's going on. Yeah, or and like he's helpful. There, yeah. Or, um, I'm not saying like there's loads of sources that like delve deep, but make it very accessible. You know, well, and, um, and even, even for the time argument, um, Deseret Book has an app that's just like, uh, what's the, what's the, uh, audible it's just like audible oh, yeah. you can Book download or something mm-hmm. yeah you can download most of the books we're discussing as an audible format mm-hmm. and listen to them in your car to and from work i mean yeah. i've i've turned people on to and they're like i didn't know that that existed like it's an amazing resource you can listen to like in fact gibbons books are actually available on audible because mm-hmm. he's, he's considered a mainstream author and yeah, all these the, books the, except the Christ who heals should be yeah. read by everyone. Yeah, I said <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't like that book. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> well, it's got uh, some, uh, yeah, uh, it's a little bit yeah. Yeah. So But no, and that's that's would be like saying you do new twenty or thirty minutes a day, like even if you were to listen to it, mm-hmm. you know, uh, because you know, I know like especially in the States you have a pretty lengthy commute if you live uh, outside the city center. But be mm-hmm. it as like that's your twenty or thirty minutes or if you listen to say 
you you listen to scriptures one way in, but like you might listen to a part of a book, like a chapter. And I, a yeah, Crystal yeah. Dao, that's that's doing something extra as well, and that's like you will internalize it after a while, you know. Uh, well, and mm-hmm. I think that I think that some of us though need to be a little bit more careful also because the missionaries want to they want to consume the level that they see from the people who are participating and helping them online. They're like, well, I want to be I want to be Robert now. I want to be Jennifer now. Like, well, uh, yeah, that's, and that's something like you, that's you not have to inculcate him. Yeah. And I say this as someone who's pretty bad OCD. And like, if I'm, if not, if I'm not an expert in a topic, like after that, like um, the whole self hatred goes to your roof. I, you know, I'm sure you've dealt with some people with pretty bad OCD like that. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. you know, proceeding from that, like, um, one has to realize, like, I'd, it's like when it comes to certain topics, and this is not ego, you know, I say this and say mm-hmm. this is a bottle. I know a heck of a lot when it comes to certain topics. And Jen knows a heck of a lot when it comes to certain topics, but we weren't there's born. So, in... there's so many of us accessible online who are more than happy to help well, missionaries. That's, 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 the, yeah, that's the purpose that's true. of this but also, Facebook uh, one, page. The other, that... the other thing is like to realize like we weren't born with this knowledge. We yeah. had to like, learn it. So like you have to start at the start, you know, and you have to like um, build mm-hmm. up. It's like uh, the uh, the uh, analogy would be like trying to learn like a language, you know. Um, yeah. Say, you know, you want to learn, say, ecclesiastical latin you know um you don't read say aquinas or the vulgate on day one you basically have to nope. learn like super basic uh, stuff to learn ecclesiastical latin yep. eventually you'll learn eventually you can read say the summa contra gentiles or summa theologia or whatever you know but you have to you know it's baby steps but once you keep doing, doing those like 10 20 20 minutes a day you will uh after yeah. say like three years after five years you will know a hell of a lot Mm-hmm. yep and that's, that's and how that's, you don't be lazy but also like but also to build up on gen Z, like yeah we're pretty accessible you know um as well, well and that and that was the point i think that some of the some of the missionaries have have kind of missed the point so the mm-hmm. point of the discussions i'm doing i'm not trying to teach you the the knowledge i'm trying to teach you the process mm-hmm. like it's the process of having the discussion it's the i try to do it the way like the way that i would perform a deposition i ask questions and i ask better questions that facilitate a response. And rather mm-hmm. than immediately posing an argument to the response, I ask a follow-up question to clarify that I understood. It's that process that, that I'm trying to get through. And with, with having, having you and Ben and, and Chris and available to the missionaries and Errol, it's not to become you, it's to utilize mm-hmm. the knowledge you've already obtained. I mean, why do you need to become Jennifer on a mission you should know no one when you can that. message jennifer <laughs> you know, right yeah, like like guys if you don't have to be an expert in catholicism robert knows a lot and, and yeah. if you want there is a way to do it you know it's just like there it, is having taken you know it's like you know if you want to be an expert in say catholicism you'll have to read like say the catechism which is a hefty book or ludwig arts from the most catholic dogma but like if you're dedicated or you're driven to do something like that's half the battle over and done with you know i mean like um you know, imagine like say uh, a certain topic. Uh, say again, let's just say the Catholicism. Like uh, you want to learn more about say why your Catholic family or friends believe X, Y, and Z. If you're driven, you know, reading like say a 300 page book, say by art or something like that, uh, it may be difficult, but like at least you're driven and you know and so forth. So you'll do it. But if you're not driven, like you don't have that desire to learn more or like interact with people positively, like you're just going to like. Um, it'll be like to heck with it you know you, you have yeah. to be driven as well you know um and, and that's something like uh theology like when it comes to church as well it's best done in uh, community like uh yes this is like an artificial online mm-hmm. community but still like a community of like uh, nerdy friends like um mm-hmm. we want like it's like we both we all love the church and we want the church to uh grow and develop and uh for members like to learn more and to be better to at getting the church as well you know and getting the gospel you know uh so you know and it, that can only really be done by community like uh learning from one another and uh stuff like yep. that you know so well you know, i know um well one of the so one of the basic... like, say a uh, lone ranger type of affair you know so the missionaries will introverts. often post mi- messages to, to any of us and they'll say what can i what books can i read what books do you suggest and i always say you know have you finished the standard works yeah. And then and then they said, well, well, yes, I've read them. Okay. Let me and, and I have this, I have this funny question and I repeat it all the time. I said, okay, let me tell you how more how much how much you have not read the standard mm. works. When Ammon was taken before King Lamoni, why? 
And why did King Lamoni offer his daughter to Ammon? It's a very, it's very simple. One ugly daughter. Yeah. It, well, it, yeah. And so it's like, well, why? And they're like, you know, I often read and I, I think about why you find a random guy wandering around the wilderness. You'd take him before the king and the king would offer him his daughter. And I said, well, the answer is in the text. What's <laughs> what's the answer? Like, oh, I don't I don't know. Uh, uh, because he was exuding the spirit because he was glowing. <laughs> and I'm like, no. It's because he was a prince. He was the son of King Mosiah. If the if the soldiers had killed him, what would have happened to the soldiers? Hey, we we killed mighty great King Mosiah's kid who we found. Yeah, you just start around. a war. <laughs> yeah, you just started a war. And of course, what is King Lamoni wanting to do? Probably join kingdoms, right? Yeah. So make if, an alliance. Like if you guys haven't, if you guys are asking yourselves questions in the text and you can't answer them, then reading Bart Ehrman or reading Thomas Aquinas or yeah. even like the crucible of doubt by Givens. You know? Yeah. Um, you like, guys are Go ahead. Uh, uh, like a, a few years ago, I actually wrote a uh, post on uh, tips on how to be an effective LDS apologist. Like, um, and it's not just for like, say the Jeff Lindsay's or the us of the world. It's like for everyone, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know, as I mentioned, like we're all called to be in some way or sense, like an apologist. Now, not as you go out and start a blog or debate people, but like you're still expected to like give a reason defense. Now, for, now I ask like, you this for the purposes of it. What is an apologist? An apologist is not someone who apologizes or says, so, uh, sorry for something. And it's also not just a religious term, like not to bring up politics, but you might have like, say, apologists for, say, the Biden uh, cabinet or like apologists for, like, say, George Bush, you know, um, and the Bush doctrine, you know. It can it's be, someone it's who gives a defense, a reason to defense. Position. Yeah. Right. It, it because the word, like, uh, because the word apologia. It appears in the New Testament in First Peter 3. And, and, yeah. and yeah, so I, and the reason I'm asking this sounds stupid, but there are people who have no idea. Yeah, they, they often think like, um, I, I, even like, I get this like every so often, not as often as uh, some people do, but like, I still get the whole, uh, why, what's an apologist? Are you saying, so are you saying sorry for something? <laughs> e even in the context where um, it's obvious it's not saying sorry about something, it's defending something, like you still get it. But yeah, it means to give a defense. I think it comes from um, Plato. Um, he's a uh, one of his uh, works um, where he... The character gives a like, reason defense behind uh, in front of a uh, council. It's been years since I read his works, but that's basically where the term comes from, and it appears in the Greek of First uh, Peter, where Peter uh, tells people to not just like the scholars, the uh, church, but like everyone to give an apologia or a reason defense for the hope that's in them. But uh, just to go back on the importance of scriptures, uh, the very first thing. I will ever suggest to everyone would be you have to have read the standard works and that's something mm -hmm. like you you can quote my uh proof text or quote mine the old testament based on say your seminary teaching it's like um and when i say seminary i mean like lds seminary not like a proper seminary like the one i went to or <laughs> jen went to but um mm -hmm. you know basically if you have not read the entirety of the scriptures and that includes yes the old testament and you don't you're not a competent reader of it and i don't mean like say you know hebrew or greek but you have you don't really know much about say this uh the narratives and the scriptures or the teachings of the scriptures you know um that's where you start and it's like i love books but like if i was on the desert island you know um as long as i had my standard works you know mm -hmm. i would be okay yep. and you know uh so like the very first thing like would be uh and if this is the only thing people do is like be very competent readers of the standard works and again yes that includes the old testament mm -hmm. well, and, 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 and learn how to ask questions of those don't just sit in sunday school and say oh this is so boring i hate isaiah well figure out why you don't understand it what are your questions now learn how to research those questions and all of a sudden scripture becomes real well, interesting yeah. i'm yeah, just like, amazed oh, at the numbers of questions that the missionaries have as they pour through the, I mean, because mm -hmm. obviously they are reading them on your missions at least, but they're pouring through these and just they're, it's like, guys, write the dang question down. If yeah. you can't answer it in the text, that's when you come and you ask a Jennifer or a Robert or a Ben mm -hmm. or, or somebody. I mean, just go ask. We can help steer you through to the the right right way. And just on the Isaiah up, you know, like, I don't know. I love Isaiah. I've never had a problem with Isaiah. You're probably mm -hmm. the same as well, Jen. And uh, you're probably the same as well, Travis. Like, Isaiah's cool. But, like, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, there's, there, uh, it's not like a case, like, say, you know, even some of myself or Jen or anyone else, like, you know, all the scriptures are as clear to us, you know, like, um, my favorite book is, like, Hebrews. I love Hebrews. I've studied mm -hmm. Hebrews a lot. 
Well, I, you know, but there's certain books that, you know, initially one will struggle with. And that's the same for anyone, regardless of your educational background. Uh, to give like one or two personal examples, you know, um, you know, I love the New Testament. But, like for a while, I struggled with Luke. Not not trying to interpret Luke. It's just like, you know, Mark's really, uh, it's one of those like, uh, it seems simple, but it's so frigging complex. John, mm -hmm. enough said, and Matthew, um, it's the best of the synoptics. Uh, come fight me on that. Luke, it's just like, it seemed like... Um, into like a different feel. I just didn't really mm -hmm. feel like a uh, push to study it. So what did I do? You know, of course I read it, but I also read a lot of stuff about Luke and Acts, you know, until like I came to love Luke, you know, and now it's not a problem going through it, you know, or like say the genealogies in the first eight or nine chapters of Chronicles. Uh, what I used to do, like when I was reading the Old Testament cover to cover, you know, would be maybe just like flick through them, like their genealogies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But after a while, you know, I kind of realized like this is kind of, there has to be something to this, you know, I don't really like skipping over chapters. So what did I do? Like, um, of course I read the texts, but I also read like say one or two very good books on genealogies in the old Testament, genealogy specifically in one Corinthian, one Chronicles one to nine. And that made the text come to your life. And like, if you're struggling with say Isaiah, you know, there's a very good commentary by Kerry mm -hmm. Mult Easton. I'm probably butchering mm -hmm. his name, but like yeah. the LDS Egyptologist, that's a good, like, um, introduction and a bit more to that uh, to the isaiah text he deals with all 66 chapters like um if you were to read that as secondary literature or brant garner's commentary on the isaiah chapters in um volume two the sixth volume um second which is like you know if you're struggling with a book like everyone like uh, myself or dan peterson or jan roach or whoever it's not like say you know we're at the level where like there's no difficult text there's text we struggle mm -hmm. to read at times you know just because like uh, it may be odd to us you know everyone goes through that hump it's just like if recognize that hump and get over it again like to go back to le learning a language team um like well, say you're struggling like say when it comes to the a verb or like say the iris tense in greek which is the um a very the iris is an absolute pain for greek uh <laughs> students uh recognize it but like you have to get over the hump and like there's certain ways to go over it. like say you know read like a, a good book or a good article on x y and z and then you'll come to like um eventually appreciate the text you know but see but see and that's that's the thing though is that are you reading it well enough that you could actually distinguish between matthew mark luke and john mm -hmm. so that you can actually see that there's differences in the texts because i think that too many people even even in the protestant community they read those as though they're the same book they, and they, they all might say exactly out the john. same they, they might yeah, think yeah. that is different, but that's about well, as far to, as it Yeah, goes. they tend to read the synoptics. Well, Matthew, Mark, synoptics. Luke, and John have exactly the same information in them, and they all say exactly the same thing from the they same perspective, not. and they don't. <laughs> no, no, they're similar, that's synoptic, but at the yeah, same time, they, they've got... Like, say, Mark is a... Um, we, we'll just assume Mark in priority for the sake of this. Like, Ma Matthew's a copy and paste with some extra Jewish stuff to Mark, and Luke is like a copy and paste to Mark with some doctor, a physician type stuff. You know, that's... That seems to be like the general uber simplistic way of approaching it, but it's not. It's like some of these differences, mm -hmm. you know, um, sometimes they're overblown, but sometimes they're actually pretty substantial, even if they're small things like titles used of Jesus or extra narratives, you know, or extra details, you know. Um, but at the same time, um, the best way to read Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is to read Matthew cover to cover, John cover to cover, Mark cover to cover, Luke cover to cover. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but as a secondary resource, yeah, sure, read them synoptically, but don't have that as the primary one. You know, if that well, makes sense. It, sometimes, yeah. sometimes people invert that. It's like, no, you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke synoptically, and you can actually have these texts actually reproduce the synoptic material. You know, but no, that's that's a useful tool for them to be like um, comparing narratives and seeing why there's differences. But no, um, yeah, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are like um, they're similar. No one will doubt that. But at the same time, the idea like there's no important differences or like yeah, they're the same thing. It's like no. <laughs> Well, see, again, the church provides a resource that it, when I was on my mission, they had this harmony of the gospels idea. Mm -hmm. And so, because the, the church, you know, obviously LDS, the internet and stuff like that was kind of new when I was a missionary 20 some odd years ago. But the idea of, of this harmony of the gospels was one of the first things that I kind of noticed was a cool little resource. Mm -hmm. And I saw Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it would, you know, whenever they had a similar story or, or a parable or something like that that was shared, looking at them and kind of for the first time, I realized these things aren't the same. There's differences, mm -hmm. at least in just the King James ed edition. So that got me saying, well, what about if I got another translation? So I went to a Christian bookstore and I got another translation and I started to compare and I started seeing. And then it, it, but what it did is it is it 
I realized I was reading at a deeper level. And at that point, then supplement your studies. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, if you're not reading at the level where you're, where you're able to answer a question in the text or even identify a difference or a, or a question in the text, then you probably shouldn't be reading a bunch of Isaiah commentaries. Yes, you don't start, even... start with how to ask a question of the text. That's not a over-spiritualized kind of touchy-feely question. Yeah. Learn how, how can I cause it. a burning in my own soul today? <laughs> how can I wrench this out of context? Of well, they, they prove history. text. You know, it's like the, well, my favorite, the first, the first thing that a missionary does when they're called is they prove text. That's the very first thing that they do because everybody yeah. gets their own favorite passage and they put it on their missionary plaque. Um, I've got my missionary plaque right there on the wall. Yeah. And mine is Ether 1227. <laughs> and I just ripped it right out of its context because that's what I thought you're supposed to do. The youth theme for next year. Do you know what it is? Mm -mm. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. Right, like, how's that going to get taken out of context? It, it's like it's like the uh, primary team, like, um, y y your uh, sons of God from Psalm eighty two six, ignoring like, but you will die like men, you know, the old judgment scene. You know, uh, yeah. Ben Speckman has actually discussed the uh, primary he once uh, came across where that was the case, but like that kind of raises the issue. Like, say, um, the King, I think the King James gets a lot of uh, bad press. I think it's actually a good translation from the seventeenth century, and. Uh, but at the same time, like, I don't think, like, this kind of brings up the same modern translations of the Bible. I think um, there's, like, very good ones. It's, like, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, there's some atrociously bad translations, like the New World Translation of the Bible. Um, but, and the... Uh, That's my the, favorite. The, the um, NIV, which... Um, I love the, the New World Translation. No, you don't. No, it's you my don't. absolute go-to. No, you don't. Yeah. No, I think, like, LDS should actually have copies of the NIV and NWT. Not because they're good translations, but, you know, um, you'll if you ever encounter JWs and your evangelicals outside the King James Only movement, they will use them, so you might as well actually have that as a ready resource initially, you know. But when it comes to, say, using yourself good modern translations, like, um, you know, there's a couple, um, when it comes to the New Testament, I'm not a fan, like, say, uh, a lot of these other writings, but Thomas Wayman, he's translation of the uh, New Testament, yeah. published by Deseret. Uh, very good translation of the New Testament. He understands the language of Dike Ao to be transformative, not legal. So um, mm -hmm. I'm glad most people don't know why that's important. Jen does. That's that's pretty significant. But like uh, the new the new revised uh, in the NRSV, the new revised uh, version from 1989, the revised uh, standard version as well from the uh, 1946, I believe. Uh, there are good ones like um, the ESV, the NASB, or like popular um, word for word. Uh, translations of the Bible, more or less, you know, of course, there's no such thing as a perfect word for word, but right. they're, they're, they're closer to the text. And, um, um, and there's other translations as well that are pretty good as well. Um, I'm not sure if there's other translations, like uh, for the Old Testament, the 1985 Jewish publication, Society Tanakh is absolutely excellent. There's and nothing there's, better. And there's loads that are actually online on Bible Hub mm -hmm. and other places. Like I use Logos, I use Bible Work, so I have them already but there's the, other even, online places as well. Yeah, even if the average missionary or member would start to say something like, I might get a better understanding of what this text is saying if I look at it in three different translations and have those three different translations be from three kind of different piles of translation philosophy and, and people might need help figuring out what that means. But you will get a better sense of what something actually says if you can see it through three or well, ten translations. And, and and as far as as far as teaching is concerned for missionaries, it's just a lack of a comprehension or understanding about what certain things are. Mm -hmm. So like the JST, the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible is not what people think it is. It's I not e and for those listening, i.e. a text or restoration of the old and new testaments. Yeah, right. like they're thinking, well, he's he's fixing what's there. Like, no, really what he was trying to do is make some King James issues a little clearer according to what was inspired and a lot of times he's using commentaries to do it so yeah, the, yeah. What, the, what, the, what i like to say when it comes to jst would be sometimes it's joseph sometimes acting as joseph and sometimes inspired in some way offering a commentary based on what he knows at the time on the king james well and and it comes back to the nature of 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 authority in the church the prophet gets to do what the prophet feels is necessary responsible for the church doesn't mean that that's going to be the right decision in 10 years, mm -hmm. but it's the right decision at that time. And that's, that's something that people outside of the church, and I was going to ask you, Jennifer, how did you, with respect to, to accepting that there are 
living prophets. What was that like for you? My very first um, thought of that was that sounds completely horrific. Some old white man in Salt Lake City. Especially one as old and white as President Nelson is. Yeah, gets to say whatever he wants. I am not down for that. Um, If it was Canterbury, it would be okay. uh, Would I? (laughs) Um, I, My own background, like, has taught me, you should be suspicious of old white men who want to control you. And so to come into a church where there's, like, a, a living prophet, I flipped out for a really long time over that. And then actually one day the missionaries, um, I had a meeting with them and they said, oh, the prophet has just announced he's going to come to, I was living in Seattle, he's going to come to Safeco Field and um, we can get you a ticket if you want to go. And I'm like, absolutely. I want to go see who's this dude who controls my life now. Um, and I went and and he was great, of course, he, he is great, but that is not what changed my mind about the idea of having a prophet, what changed my mind was I was there to get a seat about an hour early and heard everyone, it was at the baseball stadium, everyone around me is talking about their love for whatever prophet they consider like their prophet, usually the one from when they were young. Um, And they were telling stories about their prophet and, and, and just all of these things. And a lot of those people I knew, and I knew them to be intelligent and reasonable people. And the way that they were talking about the concept of profit to me just felt like it made sense. And even before President Nelson himself started speaking, it just clicked into place for me of like, okay, this is a thing. And I'm not too worried that he's going to call me up and tell me to do something that I don't want to do. I, 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 Maybe, maybe for like say the missionaries who are listening, like uh, when it comes to say like Anglicanism and like I know Anglicanism is not Protestantism necessarily, but like in when like say the broadly Protestant spectrum, um, mm-hmm. maybe you could like uh, give a TLDR version, like say the idea like prophets um, and why modern day prophets is like a theologically like a um, yeah. Know. So for 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 most Protestants and Anglicans, the idea of a modern day prophet feels they would they might use the word like. Popish, mm-hmm. and Robert can say more on the Catholic side, but the idea that there would be one person who has some kind of special access or special relationship to God is super offensive to Protestants because they have this belief of Jesus died so that we all get equal access to God. And if one dude wants to say, like, I have all believers. Yeah. So it, it, th- there's ways to deal with that. That's a, it's a reasonable objection and there's reasonable answers to it. Um, but the very concept of profit for a lot of Protestants, it sounds Catholic. And the last thing in the world they want to be thought of is, is, is Catholic. Mm-hmm. And so, so for me in, in kind of understanding it is I, I, I get that. It's like, but Latter-day Saints believe that we all have access it's 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 a foundational core of our understanding. It's kind of the premise of King Benjamin's address in the Book of Mormon. Is oh yeah, here's... that's true. But you have to understand, like, say, the uh, Reformation mentality from, like, say, since at least fifteen twenty or fifteen twenty one, when uh, fifteen twenty, when Luther wrote on the Babylonian captivity of the church, where he said, "There's not seven sacraments; there's only two. Because for mm-hmm. them, priesthood, like an ordained priesthood that we have, that the uh, Catholics have, you know." Um, that's that's an old testament or old covenant idea but not in the new testament you know um they would say like uh there's no priestly class of people because everyone is a priest you know um in the same way and for them or uh for Protestants, you know ordination is simply being in a congregational level or even on the global level just being simply set apart for a duty you know even even like say in the high tradition like anglicanism that you are a minister of their mm-hmm. understanding of priesthood would still be different than as sacramental as that was, it would still be much different than, say, the Catholic or Eastern Orthodox view. That I yeah, the same view. And, it, and it goes all the way down to maybe a, a um, like a Pentecostal person where an ordained an ordained person is is not even seen like almost as themselves. They're seen as like, I don't know, inhib- indwelled by God in a way in that role that is somehow tolerable to them. 
because that person is not necessarily more educated than anybody else in the congregation. They're not necessarily But there would still smarter. be no special priestly classes we would have, even if we don't really fun, uh, have that kind of terminology or what the Catholics mm -hmm. would have, you know, like um, even, even when like a very sacerdotal system like uh, conservative mm -hmm. Anglicanism where, you know, there is like say ordination and there's like a lot of high liter uh, important liturgy and stuff like that. You yeah, know, and, and Anglican, it, I was an Anglican before I converted, and that probably helped me to accept having a prophet, whereas the regular, like, evangelical, um, that that's, that's rough on them. I hope missionaries are patient with that, because that's an entirely different well, way of looking at let it. Let me propose this. So, so functionally, so like I was saying with, with, the, with the idea of King Benjamin, mm -hmm. so functionally, King Benjamin is a prophet king, right? He's, he's mm -hmm. giving them the word of God from a pulpit. He's telling them how to interpret whatever their understanding is, is of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. He's conveying to them a mission, a, me a message about Jesus Christ, tells them to go back to their homes and receive their own, their own revelation. So that's how the church functions today. Mm -hmm. And then as, as far as priesthood, we have kind of a division of priesthood with respect to its power and its authority. All members have access to the power by faith. Mm -hmm. And then, but there is a priestly class, right? So, so that, that kind of has its own complexity, certainly, mm -hmm. but in Protestantism, I think that what a Latter-day Saint is not going to understand is who decides when there's mm -hmm. a difference. And, and the, the appeal is always to, well, the Bible decides the Bible is, is, is how mm -hmm. we clarify to, to be fair, uh, to be fair, like, um, in just for preparation, I actually decided to reread like the Westminster confession because like, um, which is like, uh, perhaps like the most important well if, if you if you read the westminster confession of faith and you actually understand it you'll be able to have a conversation with like 90 percent yep. plus of all intelligent persons it's that important but like uh when it comes to say, chapter one on the uh perspicuity and authority of the bible and you know it would be the same when it comes to say other uh confessions like the uh anglican articles or and stuff like that it would be cut from the same thought the only infallible authoritative interpreter of the bible is actually the bible itself Mm. you know uh so you know the idea like scripture interprets scripture that's that's basically mm -hmm. where it comes from um I think the technical term for uh would be the analogia fide um you know uh I nice really, pull robert yeah yeah analogia fide. <laughs> and basically that's just like the fancy way of saying uh the clearer texts are to are to interpret the more difficult texts but yeah. of course begs the question like what determines what's clear you know, or perspicuous mm -hmm. and difficult. And usually it's like, whatever see, whatever the face value I can use to support X, Y, and Z, that, they're the clear texts. But when it comes to the difficult text or text at a face value, you know, uh, I may have to engage in exegesis. And it's like, okay, they're difficult texts. Like, you know, the issue of baptism. Like, um, it's so clear baptism is the instrumental cause of regeneration. You have it in Romans 6, you have it in mm -hmm. Acts 2, in Acts 22. But they're difficult texts. So like when it comes to say Ephesians two eight to ten, you know, that's a clear text. You know, uh, ignoring the Colossian parallel, you know, that's how it functionally plays out. So it's kind of a shell game. So like, um, you know, when we had that discussion with the uh, Prozen guy um, a few months ago, you know, mm. it's one of the things I was bringing up. Um, you know, you for instance, like when it comes to say baptismal regeneration, this is something that has divided Protestants. You know, since day one. You know, uh, you have the Lutherans, you have most Anglicans, and you have a number of other groups as well that would hold. Not only that baptism is a commandment and it's a practice you must uh, must uh, submit to, but it positively affects salvation in some way. Mm -hmm. you know, it's efficacious. Uh, yeah, you know, baptismal regeneration or some type of uh, view of that, you know. Um, you have like loads of pros, uh, when using the term pros a bit uh, broadly here to include Anglicans, you actually have that. But you also have like loads, especially in the reformed Calvinistic tradition, not all, funnily enough, um, but many who would hold it's, it's a commandment, it's important, but it's blasphemy to believe in what the Lutherans do about baptismal regeneration, you know. Um, you, you've had this divide, and like, uh, so who ultimately decides, you know, um, and how do you actually bring about unification here? Because this is not like a minor issue, you know, like say, uh, exclusive psalmody, like do you only sing the psalms in church services or can you read like uh, sing mm -hmm. other hymns as well, you know, um, something at least for us that seems kind of a... Um, yeah, very seems silly. Yeah. No, this, this is generally a real issue, not just for like them, but like, it's a salvation issue. So, like, how do you actually, how, how do you actually, one, answer this 500-year-plus question amongst Protestants, and two, bridge the ecclesiastical gap because there's a lack of communion here, you know, um, mm -hmm. and Protestantism doesn't actually have, when push comes to shove, when it comes to the central issues, a real good response. 
you know, it's basically in... my, my, it's all me, my, my tradition, you know, yeah. determines X, Y, and Z, you know, and yes, you know, I, I'm going to claim like the Westminster, the 39 Articles of Faith is subordinate to scripture, but ultimately the filter is your preconceived mm -hmm. uh, uh, presuppositions, mm -hmm. and that determines what's clear, what's difficult at the biblical text level. Yeah. You know. And then, of course, for Latter-day Saints, the, the answer to that is the, the prophet makes the determination. Sure. Yep. And that's, In... and that's... Although, I think we have to be very careful when we say that. That's I know. The... So but... how would you say that? How, how comes, would you? How would you? I would just say like, if and when best. there's like a issue that the church has to address, like um, the church will eventually step in and answer it, whether it's a moral issue or a doctrinal issue. But at the same eventually. time, they still expect us to use our brains. It's not like say, mm -hmm. no, the church has not said this, you know. So let's not think about it. You know, no, it, it expects us still to use our faculties as well. Because I'm not saying there's a problem with how you said that, but like sometimes how some LDS present it, or even how they function when it comes to that, is like. Until the church says so, uh, don't even think about it or don't even care about it, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we're still expected to use the faculties and the instruments the church has given us, and so forth. So, yeah. In in the in the U.S. context for missionaries, um, more than half of U.S. Christians are in non-denominational churches. So the beliefs of the church are not set by right, churches. Um, well, non-denominational as well. <laughs> right. well. They have a website. <laughs> They yeah, have and they have a, says, they're uh, in a network of, of other churches, which is so actually- So can I be a Unitarian whatever. here? <laughs> no. Well, not, like, to, not to make fun of it, but to, I, I guess from my perspective, looking at it, you know, the, it looks like kind of their franchises. Yeah, it, it's like the meme. How like, those... It's like the meme, you know, um, and I'll let you finish after this, but this is, I, I'll forget about it. It's like two ladies green one in there. It's like, hi, I'm Linda the Lutheran and um, hi, I'm Mary the non-denominational. It's like, oh, nice to meet you, Mary the liar, Baptist. Yep, yep. How non-denominational, especially the larger the church, this, the truer this is, how they function is the pastor of that local congregation very, very much fo functions as a prophet um if he says it's important it's important if he says it's a secondary issue it's a secondary issue no one in those congregations would ever call him a prophet would ever overtly say that that's but what as he's you doing said, functionally that's the case and that's, that's what i'm saying is that doing. functionally their authority becomes their pastor yes and um you can see why People move churches all the time because this pastor leaves and they don't like the new guy. And so they need a new guy to put their, their, their trust in that he's going to tell them exactly what they need to be told. They're basically shopping for a new prophet. They would never say that, but that's what they're doing. It, it also shows, and uh, this the following term is acceptable in Ireland, the UK. I'm not sure if it's acceptable or seen as a bad word in the US, so sorry in advance. But that's going to show the piss poor ecclesiology, i.e. theology or doctrine of the yeah. church. Wait, not all, you know, at least like when it comes to- That's Anglicans, why it's church. <laughs> yeah. You know, or like those who would say yes to most of this, you know, they do have a higher mm -hmm. ecclesiology, in, including the Anglicans that you came from. But like when it comes to say your typical normie Protestant in America or most other places, like they have a very low view of the church, but uh, not just on the global level, you know, yeah. even if they think about it, but even on the local level, it's more like um, the character sure many have like Sola Scriptura, me and my Bible or me and my pastor. And my pastor is yep. functionally my Pope. Yep. If, if the investigator goes to a church that's called something like, cross point church or venture or new life you can almost be certain their pastor is there if it sounds like an amusement park it might yes. be a park or a church well, and, and so their, the, their pastor is their prophet well and one of the things that i used to do on my mission because as, as my mission progressed i started you know i got a little bit more i guess aware as my mission progressed mm -hmm. but kind of kind of like some of the experience that you had with the member that that attended your church Mm -hmm. So I found that as I would teach people, um, in fact, so I, I attended a community in uh, in Napa, California, that was mm. really heavily Seventh-day Adventist. It okay. seemed like everybody was a Seventh-day Adventist in my area. So in, in the ward, they were either Latter-day Saints or they were Seventh-day Adventists with a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses interspersed. But um, my uh, my wife's aunt is actually one of the kind of the, I can't remember what they're called, but she's one of the equivalent of like an apostle in the Seventh-day Adventist faith. Okay. And so I kind of grew up kind of knowing a little bit about it. And I, I talked to her quite a bit about it. And, but what was happening is as I was teaching the Seventh-day Adventist, they would tell me what their church believed. And I found that it was like, I would tell them, okay, well, this is what we believe. 
And they said, well, yeah, it's the same thing. So in order to overcome that, I actually attended the mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventist church, which was convenient because it was on Saturday. It gave me something to do yeah. in the morning. And uh, we we went there and and I would go and meet with their pastor after the meetings were over and sit down. And I actually had to say, okay, pastor, tell them what you believe mm, so that I can yeah. contrast it. Because all I'm getting out of them is I tell them something and they just agree. Yep. And so, because, and so they didn't know because they weren't being taught. But I think that kind of as one of the, the points that I think we've talked about, at least we've touched on is in the church, we are not students being taught. And that is a very different dynamic that exists outside of Latter-day Saint churches because mm -hmm. they go to be taught and their pastor is usually ecclesiastically trained. He's got a theological degree. They've, you know, got their, they, they usually often tell people what they are. They're usually doctor such and such mm -hmm. because they've got a PhD from someplace in biblical studies or theology or church planting, whatever you get a PhD in. So, but they're going there to learn as a student from a mm -hmm. teacher. And that dynamic doesn't exist in the church. Yeah. And it's, it's very difficult to kind of convey that to people outside of the church that, like my my bishop is not a professional cleric. Yeah. He's and just there's pros not. and cons to that. Yeah. And, and neither are the people who give talks on Sunday. In Except fact, they might in my branch. Except in the, your branch. The person giving a talk might be a 14-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you the the onus is on you to figure out how to learn. And that's that's really something that I think that as a, as a church, we need to be more careful at emphasizing because I don't think we say it, you know what I mean? I think we all mm -hmm. kind of know it, but how many times in a conversation have you had it with, with either somebody in or outside the church and you've said it and mm -hmm. they're like, huh, I never really thought about it that way. And then they think you're a friggin' genius because you've <laughs> identified some grand issue when really all you did was say something clearly that we actually mm -hmm. all intuitively observe or know and well it's because we're not being taught at church mm -hmm. the teacher doesn't know more than maybe they have a clearer understanding of some of the passages because they read them but i've been attending mm -hmm. seminary with my son he's finally old enough to attend seminary mm -hmm. so i've been going to seminary with him and i am not thrilled i didn't attend mm -hmm. seminary as a youth because like i said i didn't i didn't really have a lot of faith and stuff but so i just i just bagged the early morning seminary but as i've attended i don't really know what we're learning it's sort of sunday school I'm not on, clear it, on, on, mon on monday it's not yeah you know. i i thought it was much more regimented than it is and we have a local member who is, he, he works for CSS at CES. Mm -hmm. That's his actual job. And he's the coordinate. I don't know what his official position is with CES, but he actually works for the church in the church education system. And he's in charge of the, the whole Institute and seminary. Cause we have colleges here locally that are, mm -hmm. that have that. And I'm not really sure what my son's being taught or, or, or what was. And it, and it varies by teacher, right? Like next year, he might have a great teacher and mm -hmm. the following year, it might be back to crap. Yeah, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily crap. I just Sorry, can't follow. <laughs> well, I can't really follow a lesson. They're, they're, they're doing a lot of verse hopping. Mm -hmm. No, in fact, I messaged Robert about some of it that I think that rather than, because, well, you mentioned it when you're in your talk with Robert that they're doing a lot of proof texting. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of the, uh, I had a, a discussion with somebody who said the Methodists are really bad at doing this because they'll proof text. They'll go through and they'll have some manual that says, now read second Nephi mm -hmm. this and read first Corinthians that and now bounce it, you know, bouncing around the scriptures to try to prove some point mm -hmm. rather than, okay. Which I, I love that the church has done that because I identified this as a problem when I was on my mission 20 years ago. Mm. And now we do a completely different Sunday school system where we actually are supposed to be going through chapters mm -hmm. and, and gaining and learning from them differently. How is that different from your own faith tradition? So as an Anglican, what do they do 
So as far as ecclesiastical training in class. Anglicans have a slight advantage in this. And and so would most of the other like liturgical churches, Lutherans, the the, the, like higher churches is what they call them because they're following a, a lectionary which said this week we're reading these passages. Not all lectionaries are created equal and everybody kind of follows a different one. But the idea is everybody's on the same page. We're reading all the way through scriptures together. Come follow me is not a great lectionary, but it's a lectionary because it says, here's the prescribed readings for for this week. Most non-denominational mega church kind of situations, it, you you get either one of two things. You get a preacher who says, I go through books of the Bible front to back and we will deal with every single verse. But when he says that, he says that in a way that also smuggles in his own opinions. So I'm telling you the real truth. We're not skipping anything, right? So he kind of is setting up his own authority or you get exactly what you're talking about, which is sort of the topical preacher who wants to preach on marriage and pulls 10 verses from across the Bible decontextualized so you, you get you get some of both and, and preferably we want more systematic readings well of it's, the texts if you want to understand what the actual text is trying to say then yeah <laughs> yeah well i i when i so when the when they first started doing that when the church set because they they shut down my ability to go physically out with the missionaries which is kind of what precipitated a lot of this is mm. i had to i realized that we could do zoom and I could go out with them yeah. via Zoom. So, um, but one of the first things that we kind of focused on was the idea that rather than than scripture hopping, which is kind yeah. of what our church still kind of does. Yeah. Yeah, and that's like it's done on like a local level when it comes to like seminary and gospel doctrine and stuff like that. It's mm-hmm. um, yeah, scripture. Which hopping. is one of the reasons I didn't really like the seminary stuff very much because they're like, well, this passage is so great. In fact, I was telling Robert one of the things that was was kind of brought up is they said that. Um, in Isaiah, they said this is one of the few times that the word Jehovah is written out in the in the uh, in the Old Testament in in the entire Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And they were acting like that's such an amazing thing. And I just wanted to raise my hand and go, "Why? Yeah. Why, why is that significant?" But everybody <laughs> thought, like, "Oh," and they just said that as though the thing itself mm-hmm. was just it's just intuitive that as that that's such a neat thing. Yeah, but none of those kids could tell you what that even means or why yeah. it would be important. And the teacher yeah. couldn't either. And yet they spent like five minutes emphasizing that as a point. And I just what was is like, this tetragrammaton you speak about? And I go, what are you talking about? And I said, so what? what's the, uh, yeah, well, as uh, Robert's not really a fan of Jehovah, right? He likes, Yahweh all the way. Yahweh all the way. It, yeah. Because there's no, there's no Jesus. <laughs> So e- e- even when I discuss things with fellow LDS, it's like I know you want to if you want to say Jehovah, that's fine, but the proper way would be Yahweh. So get used yeah, to it. Yeah. That's what I'll be saying. And so, and I mean, we don't have to be that obviously that hyper technical. It's a little bit snobbish, I think, but um, but yeah, it's it's. So I tell the missionaries, I said, look, if you if you want to teach a, a, a something, I don't care what it is, find a chapter, a mm-hmm. whole stinking chapter, and teach it out of the whole chapter. Because it'll also avoid the 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 proof texting that your investigator will start doing. Mm-hmm. But if you start proof texting, they're going to start proof texting, and now you're in a mess. Yeah, I think like the best thing, like when it comes to say like institute or gospel doctrine or seminary, would be for teachers. You know, um, and like there's some very good teachers. There's some uh, pretty meh teachers. Uh, I've had I've had a mix of them. Um, not to get the impression like you must go through the entire. Uh, say there's five chapters this week just teach on one chapter mm. or two don't feel like you have to get to everything because you know you have like 40 minutes or 60 minutes you know if it's an institute class um because like the onus it's like if you go into class like old um for like a spanish class or a latin class you'll expect like say the students have actually have done the reading in advance mm-hmm. and it should be the same when it comes to say seminary or institute or gospel doctrine you know um especially like the latter two like you're all bloody adults you should be able to like read one or two or three chapters in a week even if you have a busy schedule you know yeah you know all things being equal and like if you you know um so and even if they may not have done it like at least they have the tools to like be able to like read the remaining two three four chapters you know um but yeah focus uh focus uh 
on the idea of like say getting more bang for your buck so even if you like there's a lot of really cool, say like you're going through the gospel of john like say it's john 14 15 16 17 uh there's already a lot of stuff in older chapters so there's no way you can actually do a good job dealing with all of them like maybe just focus on john 17 and the high priestly prayer like even just a portion of it mm -hmm. and then people will actually learn more yeah drill down drill yeah. down into something instead of an inch deep all the way across mm -hmm. yeah and right. unfortunately like the inch deep across is like say uh i've often heard of like in maybe um like the lds understand that say scripture especially the bible would be like the inch it's an inch deep but it's like all 66 books uh, mm -hmm. sorry for those who accept the Dieter canon like but the other seven are cool as well but like for your typical protestant you know um you know it's like um it's it's the opposite it's actually inverted you know they they mm -hmm. may know like say romans eight or nine or something like that very 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 well but when it comes to like, the entire scope it's like very superficial so like it's mm -hmm. uh basically the lds view ass backwards and yep. they're both bad it should be like you, you should, you're not expected to be an expert like say or have the same level of competency on every single section or every single chapter but at the same time like it should be like uh both deep and um as well as broad yeah yeah even even if you went deep on one chapter a month mm -hmm. i mean shoot even one a year that would that would change how people are able to engage with scripture like it's not uh, yeah, it doesn't even like, take that much uh, it's like uh, when it comes to say, the four-year cycle that's good but uh, there's pros and cons to the four-year cycle yeah i, mean, I kind of wish there was like an eight-year cycle because no like, i do too mm -hmm. because, we can't like, cover the old testament in a year yeah no take the old testament there's one chapter there's one lesson every mm -hmm. four years one lesson on the entirety yeah. of the book of psalms and mm -hmm. and it's not arranged in any way that's helpful put the psalms that david wrote next to the thing that was going on in david's life when he was writing it because now all of a sudden it's going to make sense but now you have it decontextualized just as a psalm and people are like i don't know it sounds like a nice poem uh -huh. yeah like yeah. that's not the psalms like uh well psalms are about him so like we love her hymn book you know and yeah you know that kind of like yeah that's true like it was like the hymn book of the ancients you know, mm -hmm. even of jesus but you know it's how can you actually honestly expect like because like the psalms is important like it's 150 chapters you're crying out loud yeah. you know mm -hmm. and there's so much when it comes like the psalms is used in the book of mormon it's used in the especially in the new testament when it comes to say topology um how can you actually you you have to understand the psalms to actually make sense of a lot of the uh, messianic uh, ideas in the yeah. new testament like it's uh, again like i know there's no such thing as a perfect system and i know like gospel doctrine is like not for like historical graphical acts of jesus more like say likening scripture to your mod to everyday life but at the same time even when it's say typology or lightning texts, the very first thing you must know is like the historical grammatical meaning, you know, mm -hmm. and then you can actually, in a proper meaningful way, like find other uses to it. It's like learning a musical yeah. instrument. Like one of the very first things I was taught is like, once you know the musical theory, you'll actually have the tools to be able to break away from the theory and come up with your own stuff, but in a meaningful mm. uh, way. And that's an imperfect analogy, but that might be a good analogy. Like, say, once you understand the historical grammatical context, like Nephi definitely understood the historical grammatical context in uh, Isaiah, but because of that, he could actually use and liken it more properly or more adequately, if you will, to his situation, to the future situation as well. And the same when it comes to New Testament authors. It's like, Matthew definitely knew Isaiah 11 was an interesting context about Israel, corporate Israel, not the Messiah. But by, no, by doing that, he actually had the proper tools to actually show this kind of secondary fuller sense or census planar to use a technical term interpretation of his old testament text as well it's like we we could benefit like from knowing immediately the historical grammatical context of x y and z and that would give us the proper tools to liken it better to today or other secondary interpretations as well that are common yeah, yeah and i just just i mean we're kind of running on time and i'm not saying that we have to stop but um we were doing the anglican interview i was expecting 40 minutes it went on for almost two and a half hours you cannot get the two of us to shut up i uh, no, no no i i'm fine with it my okay my so can we can discuss the hyperstatic versus economic yes. uh, the, okay, after, okay good. we can in a second good so i want i wanted to kind of get one more piece of opinion from both of you so um in 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 effectuating change so mm -hmm. not that it's your your responsibility to do that yeah. but certainly I found that as I sit through through classes and and I had a desire to comment on, especially when somebody's saying something that isn't opinion wrong, but just it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And and how how are you addressing what you feel are uh, perspectives or or 
or methods that are being expressed by people in the church during classes that you're attending. And when you said, I just, I want to say something mm. and how have you been engaging with that? Well, I'll let, um, uh... If it's okay, I'll go first. Um, yeah, I'll give like one or two very recent examples, like recent, like last year or two. Sometimes you have to pick your battle. Sometimes people will say something mm -hmm. that you will disagree with, but at the same time, like you have to like, um, is this worth fighting over? Or oh, well, not say fighting, but like openly disagreeing about or something like that. So you have to pick your battle. Sometimes it might be better, like maybe take them in. It's like, um, maybe in the, uh, say like give an analogy. Someone comes from like an Eastern Orthodox background, and they still think like Mary had only Jesus as a son, and they might mention that as. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the Council of John 19, it was like, okay, you might like take them aside initially, like, so you have to know how to pick your battles, you know. Um, I once was asked, like, uh, last time we were doing the Old Testament here by um, the Gospel Doctrine teachers, like, well, you know, um, you know Hebrew and you're an Old Testament scholar, so like, um, can you actually discuss and tell the cast why Ezekiel 37 is a prophecy of the Book of Mormon? Mm. Um, so I, I you know, Needless to say, I had to explain like um, why that's not a direct prophecy and stuff like that, and the idea, like, say how the New Testament authors use the Old Testament, or like um, a while ago, someone said like, um, you know, um, Judas betraying Jesus was a very good thing, and um, Judas did not do anything wrong by betraying Jesus. <laughs> uh, it's like no, that's 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 just wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so you have to know how to pick your battles but once you do it's not something like arguing with someone as because that's very easy that creates a lot more like heat than light you'll have to also mm -hmm. like explain why that's the case you know and you have to on the fly like know what they know why they think this and like try to explain it to them you know um like a an errant 14 or 15 year old you know who might think something wrong um how you'll explain it to them or will be different than say a 50 year old you know and yeah. things like that so you have to know how to pick your battles and like yeah you have to make sure it, you have to make sure they know you're not just arguing with them uh it's more like no unless course they some something that's just not unto blasphemous you know that's different but like if they're just like just wrong but they mean well at the same time you, you have to know right. how to pick your battles but also how to explain it to them as well so it's more mm -hmm. like i know it when i see a type of thing but yeah. yeah my my approach is probably similar i i would also rather go with a question of like if I can see the argument that they're making and I can see, and I know where it breaks down, like I know why that's wrong, I'll try to ask them a question that's gonna get them to point it out. But if I don't know that immediately, um, I don't know that trying to get them there in the middle of gospel doctrines is gonna be helpful or effective. But a lot, a lot, a lot of times I end up in conversations with people after class or in email or stuff like that of like, tell me why you think this and, and and trying to come from a place of curiosity and trying to figure out like, can I introduce anything that they would be able to make a connection to that might help them at least get curious about what yeah, they're missing? Like, yeah, like maybe ask them like, say, oh, that's interesting. So like, you know, in an friendly, not type of gotcha type of ways, like um, mm -hmm. what would you do with this text? Because like, you know, I, I often hear it like say to say teach x y and z so yeah do you think uh it's an actual contradiction or like you know like uh trying to like create like these kind of uh, moments where like um not necessarily like to push the antithesis or like to cause mm -hmm. them to doubt necessarily but like maybe just think a bit more about their reasoning behind yeah it, but in a friendly there's manner a, so there's a guy in my old ward that i really 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 messed it up with like i did not do any of what i just said or any of what you just said and i just fought with him um there. and yeah and probably every sunday since then when he has a comment to make in sunday school he prefaces it with well i might disagree with the learned sister roach however blah 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 and like he isn't going to listen to a thing i have to say and he tells the entire room that my opinion is bunk right yeah. but i but i earned but i deserve that from him because i did not treat him with curiosity and all these things blah 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 and that guy could like backfires on me every single week that i was in that stupid ward like i love that ward but man i, I messed it up with that guy uh, if and, it's any constellation of scat like we've I, i've done For it before sure. you know uh, i'm sure travis no, I, this, yeah. Um, it, yeah. I, we've all been guilty of it so like this is like for learn those listening, from our mistakes yeah exactly like, <laughs> those listening to this like the missionaries especially like we've mm -hmm. all messed up like um i used to be very i'm still pretty argumentative depending on the person but, like sometimes like when what? the jws came um it's more like say i'm just here to like bash with them you know like, when i was younger so like 
you have, you have to get over that kind of um mm -hmm. yeah uh, uh, attitude you know it's it's because it's uh, so damn easy to actually fall into but like, you know we've all been there so i know it's scan consolation but like you know don't make the same mistakes we made you know, we speak from experiential knowledge for yeah. well, and, and if you mess and if you mess it up take your lumps yeah. apologize listen to them they're gonna say if i if i you don't have to listen to jennifer on this you earned that just take it well one of the things that i've often said i've had people say well we believe in the church and every time they say that i always go <laughs> Why do we believe that mm -hmm. again? Can oh well, you don't know about that? Like, no, I don't not sure how that works. Yeah. But we, we all believe that. Like, I, <laughs> I don't believe that. So and what it does is makes the whole class start teaching me about this yeah. thing that we're supposed to all believe in that I don't. And then I get to say, well, I don't understand how that works. Well, how does it work in light of that and, and this? Mm -hmm. And well, how does that fit into this little thing? Oh well, playing playing dumb is a great and, strategy. Well, and then and then as they as they teach me, it's funny because a lot of them will say, "Yeah, maybe, maybe we don't believe that," <laughs> and then that becomes the new kind of transition. But and I, also, I like in most cases, um, you have to assume the person is sincere, even if they're sincerely wrong. Of course, I've yeah. come across yeah. some people who have been very difficult. Like once my old ward in Utah was teaching, and someone uh, actually stopped the class and protested that I would use to describe like section 87 of Dr. Calvin's, I call it a revelation of Joseph Smith, you know, and apparently that was like wrong, you know, it's a revelation from God, you know, and stuff like that. Um... This person actually stopped my class, you know, um, I don't believe that person was sincere based on what I know about mm -hmm. them, but you know, you have, but there would be like the outlier, even if someone is dead wrong and they're spouting something wrong, they probably do sincerely believe it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so as, as difficult as it may be at times, especially if it's just so yeah. dead wrong, you know, you want to pop your head, you know, in frustration, um, you, you, you have to assume. Well, that, and, know, and the only reason I bring equal, this, they're honest. The reason I bring this up as a topic to kind of discuss and, and is that there's a lot of missionaries who are, advocating what are not doctrines so for example the the infinite regress theory like yeah. is that a doctrine of the church mm -hmm. no no but it's an allowable opinion but it's an allowable opinion and i think that that's the problem is that some of them believe that that's actually a codified you know take it to the bank this has been mm -hmm. revealed in the by restoration the, by, the way, by the way uh for those listening this thursday uh myself and blake Alster will be actually discussing that and, and i it. well i was watching uh the uh the discussion he had with jacob hansen and uh who's the other hayden girl hey yeah and mm -hmm. so it was funny because hayden actually kind of agrees with that and as they were discussing hayden was was kind of back pedaling a little bit saying well i'm not really you know i'm i'm open to having my mind changed and mm -hmm. because you know blake it's really difficult to believe no, that's, in that, regress and talking to Blake Osler. Topic, but that's yeah. the thing I like about Hayden. He's actually open-minded. He even yeah. asks me these questions about why I'm an open taste. So, yeah. um, mm. which again is, you know, what's what's really interesting is I found, and this is my own my own kind of testimony of the of of the gospel, is that I have through just kind of a dumb study of the scriptures, and a, a very superficial reading of a lot of the the positions of the church developed an understanding of certain positions so for example i i don't i i personally reject the infinite reg regress i don't think that that's taught i don't think it's an essential opinion i don't think it's something that that is that is i uh, i think that people believe in it but it, it's certainly not something that's clearly taught in scripture really by anybody in the church and so but but even even with respect to an understanding of of god um, God's foreknowledge in the context of an open theism, I didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of infinite regress. I didn't know what open theism was, but those were my opinions. So reading people who had actually expressed those ideas that were intelligent and educated, trained in theology, was comforting to me to realize that I was I was on the right track. At least, at least as far as I'm I'm understanding something. I'm not mm -hmm. just wrote reading scriptures without any any kind of comprehension of what they are and so i think that that's another testimony builder is as you study the scriptures to read something or to talk to somebody um you know reading robert's books has been really insightful i've, I've almost through all of them and mm -hmm. and and uh talking to people who have have kind of that training and realizing that what you're learning is accepted acceptable positions and opinions about mm -hmm. the church and about its history it is comforting and i think that there's a lot of testimony that can be gained 
by including those materials in your study. Yeah. So, but uh, with that, we can we can end. Yeah. Fun talk. Well, thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming. This has been great. I I can't tell you how much I I love the missionaries, and I think that it's it's not a it's not a let's train the missionaries it's this is what some members of the church have obtained to based mm -hmm. on their own diligence their own study and their own interest in religion and theology and their desire to know god and not that the missionaries need to be robert or jennifer but that they can use robert and jennifer as resources Love, 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 love the missionaries. Oh gosh, I happy, I just happy to help to in death. any way. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I just think that it's an invaluable resource to have have something. And I, I think that some people misunderstand what the purpose of a Facebook group that has a bunch of mm. nerds in it is. <laughs> and it's not to it's not to rewrite the rewrite their will or to teach them some esoteric stuff that they can't learn from the mainstream. No, church. but so that they have a person to grab to say, help, help catch me yeah. up on this. Well, I mean, I mean, you're talking to somebody who's Anglican and like, I don't know how to, and not that tell me what Anglicans believe, right? That's not what they need. Right. Right. Like, why are we talking past each other? Yeah. Please explain why to me. Why did Leo did, new, did not enroll in 1896? To say that the Anglican Church started because of King Henry VIII wanting a divorce is equal to saying that the LDS Church started because Joseph Smith wanted to be a polygamist. That's right. how no, it, it, it. The LDS Church started because <laughs> Joseph was uh, tired of doing farm work. Don't you know what I mean? Oh, that's I forgot. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, he was so he was so lazy that he decided <laughs> he wanted an massive. easier life. Yes, he wanted a much easier life that wouldn't result in his being despised by the majority of people but no that, that's a good point. inevitable murder <laughs> but that's a good point but that kind of brings up like lds whether missionaries or like not missionaries like the normies mm -hmm. um should not be afraid to like read like literature like um i'm not saying anti-lds literature but like should not be mm -hmm. afraid to like read what other groups christian and non-christian believe and why they believe it will help them it'll help yeah because like say if uh say you know, we have Jen, the Anglican minister, and like um, someone wants to bone up on Anglicanism to actually be able to uh, communicate with her. You know, um, I, f I fail to see like why it would be a problem to read the Articles of Faith or like a good introduction to Anglicanism. Mm -hmm. Because one, it will allow for better communication, and that's what you want. You know, you want mm -hmm. better ca uh, communication, you want better catechesis, blah, blah, blah. But also, it will force you to like, in a good way, um, uh, make you think of what okay so that's what the anglicans believe and you know of course jen is a smart person she's not an idiot so you know she believes x y and z what do you believe not x y and z you know and that mm -hmm. will force you like if you haven't already like you know think of why and study why you actually believe what uh differently you know that's always a positive thing you know for 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 kids who are not yet on their mission, but they know where they're going, like that brief period of time where you know where you're going, but you're not yet under the restrictions about what you can read, the, there is a super helpful little series of books called A Very Short Introduction. And it's a very short introduction to Catholicism, to Anglicanism, to Evangelicalism, to whatever. And they're seriously like less than 60 pages. And if you're going to an area that's highly Catholic, please read a very short introduction to Catholicism and you will be far and ahead above your peers who are just starting out with you. And it's, it's not, it's not anti to read. So like, for example, if you guys know who James White is, he's a pretty antagonistic person against LDS claims. He refuses to debate me. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than reading his letters to a Mormon elder, Mm -hmm. right which is a very antagonistic book that which largely grotesquely misrepresents read, read a the lot london of baptist confession of faith right read or read one of his textbooks yeah and then he'll actually explain what his theology is yeah it's like uh, he, you'd be much it, better to have White a he's actually very good at describing calvinism yeah like, he's uh, he, yeah he's book, he, uh debating calvinism he did with dave hunt of uh of the god makers um yeah. book He's hunt, not an um, idiot. He's just dishonest when it comes to representing LDS theology. He's actually a very yeah, intelligent and, person. And also, he's pretty bad when it comes to Catholicism as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he, or and, and Islam and any other, <laughs> Whatever, any you other know. faith tradition he tries to <laughs> But no, to he's represent. very good when it comes to you describing his faith. Like, uh, yeah. you know, well, he knows what he's, he knows what he believes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it, it's, it's just a, it's just a, and, and, and so 
and in the and I, I disagree with the position that the that missionaries are not supposed to be looking at other materials outside the gospel library because in the standard works it says that seeking knowledge out of the best books and, and also and it's just I, choosing I, I like, the best books i like what's said about the apocrypha in section 91 because you can transpose that like any other scriptural yeah. text or any other source um if you're guided by the spirit you can actually be able to discern the positive from the con it's like there's no ideology there's no religion that's zero percent correct every group is a certain level of uh has a certain level of truth like um you're no longer a believing communicant anglican but i'm sure like you would actually say like anglicans have the truth on their genes. like there's a number of um aspects or nuances anglicanism ha mm -hmm. would have with a shared belief when it comes to latter-day saints that like as an anglican you have a better appreciation of than your typical lds if that makes mm -hmm. sense you know and you know the same when it comes to say my uh roman catholic background here in ireland you know stuff like that so there's no ideology that's on a scale of zero to 100 zero even satanism is correct when it comes to say there's some type of supernatural even if they do pervert mm -hmm. that you know and so forth so one should not be afraid to like read like informed defenses of other positions or even like summaries of other positions you know uh, because sometimes they're correct and on the point that you would agree with but they might actually be able to bring like a lot more to the table because they may have studied it more they may have more yeah. sources like um and things like that you know so yeah well, what I, I, wish found, they, I wish they weren't so limited. Well, and what, what I found on my, my mission and in my missionary labors, helping missionaries since I got home, we have, they, they were teaching a, about seven or eight years ago, they were teaching a guy who was working on his master's in, in divinity. And, and uh, you know, he was troubling for the missionaries because I think he was being a little antagonistic. And what was happening is it was, and they said, oh, he's really antagonistic. I said, and so I went and I met with him and I'm like, he's not antagonistic. You guys are antagonistic. And they said, well, mm. what do you mean? He's raising points. You don't understand what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And you're immediately attacking something that you're not clarifying that isn't actually what his position is. So so recently in the Facebook group, there's this somebody somebody said this woman believes that Adam's transgression or sin created a, a problem in our DNA. Yes. And it's like that's apostate. No. Not necessarily because the fall created mortality. It, it, mm -hmm. it, in our theology, we are corrupted creatures housing the spirit that is the actual child of God. So it's we fight against our flesh by submitting our spirit to the spirit and controlling the flesh. But the flesh has disease and they... Those are all part of the DNA. So it's yeah. not a matter of she's wrong or crazy, which is what a lot of some missionaries were saying. It's that she's not saying it in a way that you understand because you think she's teaching original sin, which is really mm -hmm. not what she's saying. Well, we reject or, original sin. Or even even if an investigator is saying something that's wrong, like, uh, you know, solo scripture or the, um, to you, like, unknowingly, like, say, well, they just believe it's the me and my Bible and their tree, ignoring, like, say, confessions and creeds and stuff like that, you know. Um, yeah, lo lots of values of this kind of knee jerk reaction. Like, now it is true. Like, you know, we're right. If you were to boil it down, we're right and they're wrong. You know, mm -hmm. if you were to boil it down to like very bare basics, but at the same time, uh, often you're uh, you can be right, but for the wrong reasons. And like mm -hmm. um, a lot of missionaries, yes, you belong to the true church, but that doesn't mean you know jack about what the church teaches or what other people believe. The, the, and and this is where I mean, Elders are gonna are gonna fight against that, and and sisters are gonna sweetly smile and offer an emotional story, and neither neither response is helpful. Yeah, yeah, because well, like, it, put yourself on the shoe of the other person. Like, would you accept mm -hmm. that for like if they're a Presbyterian or a Seventh Day Adventist? And like, imagine yeah. like say two Christadelphia, like a Christadelphian married couple knocks on your door, and you know they don't believe Jesus preexisted, they don't believe in a supernatural Satan. Would you accept your like um, that from their perspective to defend their doctrines? And if your answer is no, it's like there's mm -hmm. clearly like some kind of double standard going on here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what I so to get out of a difficult situation, this is what I always tell the missionaries of like, look, to get out of a difficult situation, somebody obviously knows more than you do. They raise an objection. And the last thing you want to do is start contending with them. And and from a legal perspective, from my perspective, arguing the person who bears the burden of proof loses. Mm -hmm. because to maintain a burden of proof is nearly impossible from a legal perspective. And that's why we're always trying to transfer the burden of proof 
to the other person. And so affirmative defenses and things in, in, in lawsuits are really important in that way to, to, to transfer that burden to somebody else. So as you do that, what you do when somebody raises something like they say, well, the Bible alone is the word of God. As soon as you say, well, we have an open canon, you've just created a burden of proof. Mm -hmm. yeah. So rather than doing that, ask, ask them, where them in the Bible does it teach that? What are you or talking where in the Bible about? Does it say, or, or no, uh, like, special revelation ceased. What are you talking about? Yeah. I mean, just it can be that simple. <laughs> huh? Actually, mm -hmm. dumbfounded and shocked because it really is by our theology. I, I mean, when I was raised, the idea that the Bible was a closed canon is something I didn't learn until I was a, an early teenager, mm -hmm. went to a Baptist church with a girlfriend of mine and thought, you believe what now? And it was there, shocking there to me. There are certain issues that we do definitely bear the burden of, like when, when we're positively mm. affirming Joseph's prophecy. Certainly, yeah, like that. certainly. Yes, but we should not be like taking on extra burdens when the burden is on them. Like right. If they were to claim um, special revelation or, uh, when I say public revelation, I mean public revelation on the same power as the biblical books. Uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of nuance here. So public revelation ceased with the inscripturation of the final book in the New Testament. It's like, okay, and the verse that teaches this, and kind of show like they might try out the verses, but then they'll soon realize like they're easily shot down. So that might actually get them to think like, is this true? Because and so how how they could how could they how they use your expertise though is that they can go and they can say, look, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain it to me? Pull out their notebook, which I tell them all to carry a dang notebook mm -hmm. with them, because how do you how do you maintain what Jennifer's problems are? And consistently convey them from meeting yeah. to meeting if you're not writing them down. And be sure also to ask or at least make note of not just what what they're saying, but like, so like maybe some of the presuppositions that are underlying this. Like, I don't really see this in this text. Like, say, uh, Revelation, say they think Revelation 22 teaches it. Like, um, okay, the presupposition there would be like the book there is not just Revelation, it's the entirety of the Bible and stuff like that. So maybe like making a note. Uh, of the presuppositions mm -hmm. as well, because if you can actually answer the presuppositions for, like, say, one or two things, um, you know, that will, like, uh, get rid of, like, most of the texts that are going to be brought up. Because if you can show, like, none of these texts can actually, from the get-go, teach X, Y, and Z, uh, that kind of neutralizes all possible proof texts as well. Now, that that's something, that is a skill that's, um, it might seem, like, very simple, but, like, it's something that you have to pick up. It's you know, complicated. Yeah. It's like the laws of logic and the rules of logic. Like, you, you so, can't know them when you see them, but, like, you have to be able to think on the fly as well. You know, it's, So how, it's how they can learn those, though, um, with respect to that, I think, is you get, the, you get the defined issue, you have them explain it, then you end the meeting mm -hmm. and say, okay, thank you for sharing <clears throat> all of that. We'll, uh, let's set up another meeting for next week. And then you go call Jennifer. Or then you go mm -hmm. call Robert and you say, here's what they talked about. That way that even the discussion is more specific. Mm -hmm. I was telling a missionary yesterday, I said, if you call Robert and you say something like, they believe in, we've explained the Godhead. They explain the Trinity. We don't understand what they're explaining mm -hmm. and we're not sure how to respond to it. And, and we, they keep saying it's the same. Tell us what we're supposed to do about that. Mm -hmm. Well, how would you address that? Because that's the whole point of missionaries. I, I, again, I think the church puts too much pressure on them that you can do it on your own. In my mission, I had a bishop who we walked in. We had just been transferred in the area. There'd been no missionaries in the area for over a year. They transferred my companion and I in cold. And we looked at the area book and had nothing. We go to church that Sunday and walked in. And the bishop's like, oh, it's good to have elders here and missionaries at all. And what are you guys going to do to get missionary work in the church? And I said, well, bishop, we're going to get the members involved and get them to start helping to bring their friends and family to church who aren't members. And we're going to teach them. And he says, well, you can't put that burden on the members. And, and we had this fight. So and I'm like, well, we're actually the teachers. You guys are the finders. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the dynamic of the church. Yeah, once once like a lot of members of the church and like even missionaries themselves divest this, themselves as like uh, the missionaries are the experts. Uh, missionaries are here to teach, you know, as you noted. But like they tend to be um, like 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. And, like, so they don't have much life experience. And I'm not saying they're adults, but at the same time, I, I've i only come across like one or two missionaries who really know their stuff. And they tend to be adult converts who study mm -hmm. the faith 
you know, like the two of us before making the plunge, if you will. Um, so, like, they're just there to know the basics. You know, that's why they're uh, the victims of so many gotcha tactics by mm-hmm. Durbin at all. Um, you know, they they probably never even thought of infinite uh, regress or the kind of forward discourse, you know, before they uh, went on the mission. Um, but once, like, as a church, as a culture, we kind of stop imputing to them this level of authority or this level of expertise and kind of realize, um, you know, it's the adults and the uh, more stable, geographically mm-hmm. sta- uh, speaking, members of the Warden Unish that are to um, be more not... informed and help teach and stuff like that. That, that will uh, improve things. And so what was funny about this story, though, is not a week later, after we and I had this discussion, there was announced a worldwide missionary broadcast with President Hinckley, where it was a special event. It was in, two, it was in 99. President Hinckley got up and he says, listen, members, it's your responsibility to bring converts to this church. And if you're not helping the missionaries, you're you're failing in your, I mean, basically it was just for like an hour, he went off on it. Just, it was just a random, it's, it's on, the, it's in the church website. You can, you can find it. It's his worldwide missionary broadcast from President Hinckley. Yeah, it's fantastic. And literally, so what was great about it is I got to sit in the pews with the bishop sitting up on the stand with the screen behind him, listening to this, and I got to sit there and smile at him as President Hinckley is telling him exactly what I had told him a couple of weeks prior to it. But it's just this this understanding of this dynamic that, I mean, basically the mission, the mission role, missionary role is invite to introduce people to the Book of Mormon, invite them to read it, to help them to be encouraged to read it and then to teach them five lessons which basically form an outline of our beliefs Mm -hmm. and that's it beyond that go ask robert call call jennifer Mm -hmm. (laughs) and 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 don't don't feel like you have to be burdened with some massive library of books in your room robert (laughs) he's a show off he's just Showing it all. I have a friend that I have a friend that I just well into the rooms. So I have a I have a friend that I I uh, I was talking to him about Robert because I want him to I want him to listen to your podcast. And I said, look at this guy; he's read all those books. And he's like, he hasn't read all those books. That's a yes, he has. That's a screen. <laughs> like, no, you listen to the podcast, man, and I guarantee you, after about thirty minutes of listening to him, you'll know he read those books. Yeah. It's not on the screen. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's amazing. So, but All no, right. it's it's a, it's a helpful resource. Thank you guys so much for for uh, talking with me today. Absolutely, thank it's you my for pleasure. having us. And for those who want to listen to part two, we will debate the economic versus hyperstatic filioque. <laughs> Not Jen is the apostate filioqueist, and I will represent the Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> Gregory Apollon is denying Ron. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Must be fun. <laughs> Yeah, nerds, 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 nerds. Yeah, I know. I just don't anyway. have the time to be that that big of a yeah. nerd. No, Contra Aquinas in the errors of the Greek in the Council of Florence. Oh yeah. No, I do that every once in a while when I do going to give a talk in church. I'll give some big, long, complicated theological say. So today I was asked to talk about whatever, and everybody's like, no, I'm, "I'm talking about kidding. the temptations of Christ tomorrow." So I'm addressing directly whether Christ could have actually sinned. Oh, nice. He could have. <laughs> Well, he could. If he if he couldn't, what's the point? Yeah, yeah, it makes temptation nonsense. But yeah, uh, I'm just yeah. I'm gonna be calling break. I'm actually gonna be calling from the journal discourses and other sources. Just to oh, make I love sure it. Uh, Look in their faces. I'm not gonna have a bishop. Uh, <laughs> all right, you guys, I gotta run. All right, we'll it's see you. Thanks a lot. We'll Jennifer. definitely have to do something in sacramental theology. Um, yeah, so, so, awesome. love it. Bye. All right, we'll see y'all. Thanks a lot.